My name is Nathan Redhawk, and this story happened to me back in 1994. I was living in a small town in northern Minnesota, a place where everyone knew each other, and the forest was never far away. I grew up there, with the woods being my playground. Hunting, fishing, and hiking were second nature to me. Life was simple, but it had its share of excitement. That summer, my buddy Ray and I decided to go on a camping trip. Ray Baptiste was one of those friends you have your whole life. We'd been through thick and thin together since kindergarten. Ray was a bit of a jokester, always looking for a laugh, but he was solid when things got serious. We planned to head out to an old camping spot near the edge of the Boundary Waters, a place we hadn't visited since high school. It was remote, perfect for some peace and quiet. We packed light, a couple of tents, some fishing gear, a cooler full of beer, and enough food to last us the weekend. Neither of us thought to bring a gun. I mean, we were in Minnesota. The biggest threat out there was probably a raccoon raiding your food stash. We left on a Friday morning, aiming to get there by noon. The drive was uneventful, just miles of trees and the occasional deer darting across the road. We reached the trailhead around noon, parked the truck, and started the hike in. It was about three miles to the campsite, a spot we called the Hollow, because it sat in a natural dip surrounded by trees. It was perfect for camping, secluded and quiet. We got to the Hollow, set up our tents, and gathered some wood for a fire. The afternoon was spent fishing at a nearby stream. We caught a few trout enough for dinner. By the time the sun started setting, we were back at camp, cooking our catch over the fire and sipping on cold beers. Ray started telling stories, as he always did. He talked about the time we snuck into the old Johnson barn and found that stash of old comic books, or the time we got lost in the woods for a whole day when we were kids. We laughed, reminisced, and enjoyed the crackling fire. The sky was clear and the stars were out in full force. It was around midnight when things started to get strange. We heard a noise, something like a branch snapping. Ray looked at me, and I shrugged. Probably just an animal, I thought. But then we heard it again, closer this time. Ray stood up, grabbing a flashlight. You hear that, Nate? Yeah, probably just a deer or something. Ray shone the light around the edge of the campsite. Nothing but trees and darkness. He turned off the flashlight, and we went back to our conversation, but we were both a little on edge. It was too quiet, the kind of quiet that makes you feel like you're being watched. We decided to call it a night and climbed into our tents. I fell asleep quickly but woke up to a rustling noise outside. It was soft at first, like someone moving stealthily. I lay still, listening. The rustling grew louder, and then I heard Ray's voice, low and tense. Nate, you awake? Yeah, you hear that? Yeah. What do you think it is? No idea. Let's check it out. We unzipped our tents and stepped out into the cool night air. Ray had his flashlight again and I grabbed a stick from the firewood pile, feeling a bit silly but wanting something in my hand. We stood there, listening. The rustling had stopped, but the silence was even more unsettling. Maybe it's nothing, Ray said, but his voice didn't sound convinced. Just as we were about to go back to our tents, we heard a low, almost guttural sound. It wasn't an animal noise, at least not one I recognized. It sent a chill down my spine, and I could see Ray's face pale in the light of the flashlight. Let's get the hell out of here, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. We packed up our tents as quickly as we could, our movements frantic and clumsy. The noise started again, louder and closer. 
It was a shuffling sound, like something dragging itself through the underbrush. We didn't stick around to find out what it was. We grabbed our packs and started down the trail, moving as fast as we could in the dark. As we walked, I kept looking back, expecting to see something following us. The forest was eerily silent, except for our hurried footsteps. We were about a mile from the campsite when Ray stopped abruptly. Did you hear that? I hadn't, but I trusted Ray's instincts. He shone the flashlight around, and that's when we saw it. Eyes. Glowing eyes staring at us from the darkness. They were too high off the ground to be a normal animal, and the shape behind them was all wrong. It was tall, thin, almost skeletal, with long limbs that moved in an unnatural way. Run! Ray shouted, and we bolted. We ran through the forest, branches whipping at our faces, the beam of the flashlight bouncing wildly. I could hear Ray breathing heavily beside me, and my own heart pounded in my chest. I didn't dare look back. We just kept running, driven by pure fear. When we finally reached the truck, we threw our gear in the back and jumped in. Ray fumbled with the keys, his hands shaking. The engine roared to life, and we tore out of there, gravel flying. We didn't stop until we were miles away, back in the safety of the town lights. We didn't talk much on the drive back, both of us too shaken to make sense of what we'd seen. Ray dropped me off at my place, and we promised to meet up the next day to talk things over. That night I didn't sleep. Every time I closed my eyes, I saw those glowing eyes and that twisted shape. The next morning I called Ray. No answer. I figured he was just as shaken as I was and needed some time. But when I still hadn't heard from him by noon, I started to worry. I drove over to his place, but his truck wasn't there. I asked around, but no one had seen him since the night before. I went to the police, but they didn't take me seriously. Just another camper spooked by the woods, they said. But I knew something was wrong. Ray wouldn't just disappear like that. I decided to go back to the hollow, see if I could find any clues. I arrived at the trailhead, my heart pounding. The place looked the same as it always had, but it felt different. I hiked back to the campsite every snap of a twig making me jump. When I got there, everything was just as we'd left it. Our fire pit, the spot where our tents had been, the stream where we'd fished. But there was no sign of Ray. I spent hours searching, calling out his name, but there was nothing. As the sun started to set, I knew I had to leave. The thought of being out there in the dark again was too much. I headed back to the truck, my mind racing with possibilities. Where could he have gone? What had we seen that night? Back in town, I tried to get the police to search the area, but they were reluctant. They organized a small search party, but after a couple of days with no leads, they called it off. Ray was officially a missing person, and I was left with more questions than answers. Weeks turned into months, and there was still no sign of Ray. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was out there, something that had taken him. I did some research, trying to find out if anyone else had seen anything similar. I came across stories of a creature, a humanoid figure that lurked in the forests of the north. They called it the Tall One, an old legend among the native tribes. But it was just a story, right? I tried to move on with my life, but the memories of that night haunted me. Every time I went into the woods, I felt like I was being watched. I stopped camping, stopped hiking, stopped doing the things I loved. The forest that had once been my refuge now felt like a place of danger. A year later, a hiker found Ray's truck abandoned in a remote part of the woods miles from where we had been. 
There were no signs of a struggle, no clues as to what had happened. The police reopened the case, but it went cold again quickly. Ray was gone, and no one could explain why. I still think about him, about what we saw that night. I don't know what the tall one is or if it even exists outside of my nightmares. But I do know that something out there is capable of making people disappear without a trace. I stay away from the woods now, keeping my distance from the place that once felt like home. Sometimes, late at night, I sit on my porch and stare into the darkness, wondering if those eyes are out there, watching me. The world is full of mysteries, and some of them are better left unsolved. Ray's disappearance taught me that much. Life goes on, but the shadows remain, and the memory of that night will always be with me. My name is Luther Blackfoot, and this happened to me in 1993. I was living in Barstow, California, a small desert town that never quite managed to shake off its wild west roots. Life was slow, hot, and dusty, just the way I liked it. I worked as a mechanic at a local garage, fixing up old cars and motorcycles for the folks around town. My days were filled with the hum of engines and the smell of motor oil, and my nights were spent with a cold beer at Molly's Tavern. One evening, after a particularly long day at the garage, I decided to take a drive out into the desert. I often did this to clear my head, to feel the vast emptiness around me. It was peaceful out there, just me and the stars. That night, though, I had an itch to explore a bit further than usual. There was an old abandoned mine a few miles out, and I'd been meaning to check it out for a while. I packed up my old Ford pickup with some supplies and headed out just as the sun was setting. The drive was uneventful, the desert landscape slipping by in the twilight. I reached the mine as darkness fell, parking my truck a few hundred yards away. The entrance was boarded up, but it didn't take much effort to pry the old wood away. I slipped inside, my flashlight cutting through the thick, dusty air. The mine was as silent as a tomb, the only sound the crunch of gravel under my boots. As I explored deeper, the air grew cooler and the walls closer. I could see old mining tools scattered around, remnants of a time long gone. I was about to turn back when I heard something, a faint, almost imperceptible noise. It was like a whisper, a rustle in the dark. I paused, listening intently, but it was gone as quickly as it had come. Shrugging it off, I continued my exploration, but the uneasy feeling lingered. Eventually, I stumbled upon a small chamber. It looked like it had been used as a storage room at some point, with rusted barrels and broken crates piled haphazardly. As I moved my flashlight around, something caught my eye, a small, dusty leather-bound journal half-buried under a pile of debris. Curiosity got the better of me, and I picked it up, brushing off the dirt. The pages were yellowed and brittle, filled with neat, cramped handwriting. I started to read, and what I found was both fascinating and disturbing. The journal belonged to a man named Elias Crawford, a miner who had worked here in the early 1900s. His entries spoke of strange occurrences in the mine, odd noises, shadows that seemed to move on their own, and an overwhelming sense of being watched. Elias wrote about his fellow miners disappearing, one by one, and how the remaining men grew more paranoid and fearful with each passing day. His last entry was a frantic scrawl, barely legible, mentioning something about a skinwalker, and a final plea for anyone who found his journal to leave the mine and never return. I didn't know what to make of it. Skinwalkers were a part of my heritage, a Navajo legend about shape-shifting witches— 
I'd always dismiss them as stories to scare kids, but reading Elias's words gave me pause. I decided it was time to leave. The air felt heavier, and the darkness seemed to press in on me. As I turned to go, my flashlight flickered and died, plunging me into complete blackness. I cursed under my breath, fumbling for my spare batteries. As I did, I heard the noise again, closer this time. A soft, scraping sound, like something being dragged across the ground. My heart pounded in my chest as I hurried to replace the batteries, the darkness around me feeling more oppressive by the second. Finally, the light came back on, and I swept the beam around the chamber, but there was nothing there. I practically ran back to the entrance, the feeling of being watched growing stronger with every step. When I finally emerged into the cool night air, I breathed a sigh of relief. I quickly boarded up the entrance again and made my way back to my truck. As I drove back to town, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was following me, lurking just out of sight. I tried to put the experience out of my mind, but it haunted me. Over the next few days, I started noticing strange things around town. People I knew were acting odd, distant. There were rumors of disappearances, folks going missing without a trace. The sheriff, Jack Dubois, a grizzled old-timer with a no-nonsense attitude, seemed particularly on edge. I caught him one night at Molly's, nursing a whiskey and looking like he hadn't slept in days. "'Jack, you hear anything about folks going missing?' I asked, sliding onto the bar still next to him. He gave me a hard look, his eyes tired and wary. "'Yeah, Luther. More than I'd like. You seen anything?' I hesitated, then told him about the mine, the journal, and the noises I'd heard. He listened without interrupting, his expression growing darker with every word. Damn fool thing to do, going out there alone, he muttered when I finished. You know better than to mess with things you don't understand. I didn't think it was real, I admitted. Just an old story. Stories have a way of being true out here, he said grimly. You stay out of trouble, Luther. And if you see anything strange, you come to me first. I nodded but his words did little to ease my mind. The sense of unease grew stronger with each passing day. More people disappeared, and those who remained were jumpy, suspicious. It felt like the whole town was teetering on the edge of something terrible. One night, I was jolted awake by a loud crash outside my window. Grabbing my flashlight, I crept to the window and peered out. In the dim light... I saw a figure moving near my truck. I couldn't make out any details, but it was hunched and moved with an unnatural, jerky gait. My heart raced as I quietly slipped out the back door, circling around to get a better look. As I got closer, the figure straightened up and turned towards me. It was humanoid, but there was something off about it. Its limbs were too long, its movements too fluid like it was made of something other than flesh and bone. Its eyes glinted in the darkness, reflecting the light from my flashlight like a predator's. I froze, unable to move or speak. The creature stared at me for what felt like an eternity, then it slowly backed away and disappeared into the night. I didn't sleep at all that night, my mind racing with fear and confusion. I knew I had to do something but I didn't know what. Going to the sheriff seemed pointless. What could he do against something like that? The next day, I decided to take matters into my own hands. I gathered a few supplies, food, water, a knife, and a flashlight, and headed back to the mine. I had to know what was going on, and if there was any way to stop it. The drive felt longer this time, the landscape more desolate and unforgiving. When I reached the mine, 
I took a deep breath and pried the boards off the entrance once more. Inside, the air was even colder than before, and the sense of foreboding was almost palpable. I made my way back to the chamber where I'd found the journal, my footsteps echoing eerily in the silence. As I entered the chamber, I saw something that made my blood run cold, the bodies of the missing townspeople strewn across the floor like discarded dolls. Their eyes were wide open, faces frozen in expressions of terror. I backed away, fighting the urge to vomit. That's when I heard it again, the soft, scraping sound. I turned, and there it was, standing in the entrance to the chamber. The creature. It moved towards me, its limbs bending at unnatural angles. I raised my knife, but I knew it was useless. Just as it reached me, a gunshot rang out, and the creature recoiled, hissing. Sheriff Dubois stood at the entrance, his rifle aimed at the creature. Run, Luther! he shouted, firing again. I didn't need to be told twice. I bolted past him, my heart pounding in my chest. We ran through the mine the creature close behind. It moved with terrifying speed, closing the distance between us. Just as we reached the entrance, Jack turned and fired one last shot, hitting it square in the chest. The creature let out a piercing screech and collapsed, its body convulsing violently before going still. We stood there, panting and shaking. Jack lowered his rifle, his face pale. What the hell was that thing? I asked, my voice trembling. I don't know, he replied, wiping sweat from his brow. But it's over now. Let's get out of here. We made our way back to town in silence, both of us too shaken to speak. The disappearances stopped after that, and life slowly returned to normal, but I could never forget what I'd seen. The memory of that creature haunted me, a reminder that some stories are more than just tales, they're warnings. I still live in Barstow, and I still work at the garage, but I've never gone back to the mine. Some things are best left undisturbed. And every now and then, when the night is quiet and the desert wind blows just right, I think I hear that faint, scraping sound, a reminder that some stories are true. My name is Zane Wilcox, and this happened to me about six months ago. I'm a park ranger at Eldridge State Park, a lesser-known spot tucked away in the rugged hills of New Hampshire. I've been working here for about five years now, ever since I moved out here from Chicago to get away from the city life. I've always loved the outdoors, and this job felt like a perfect fit. It was a Tuesday, I think. The day started like any other, with a cup of coffee and a morning briefing with the other rangers. The park was pretty quiet, which wasn't unusual for this time of year. Most of the tourists were long gone, leaving behind the serene silence of nature that I loved. My partner, Janine, was off for the day, so I was running solo. I decided to take a hike up to Clearwater Trail a spot that usually needed some maintenance after the winter storms. As I walked, I noticed how the forest was coming back to life. The air smelled of pine and damp earth, and the birds were singing again. I spotted a few deer tracks and a fox darting through the underbrush. Everything felt peaceful. I reached the trailhead around midday and started clearing some fallen branches and debris. About an hour in, I heard something that sounded like a scream. It was faint, but enough to make me stop what I was doing. Probably just some kids messing around, I thought to myself. But then I heard it again, louder this time. It wasn't a scream of joy or surprise, it was pure terror. My heart rate kicked up a notch. I grabbed my radio and called in 
but the signal was spotty out here. Ranger Wilcox to base. Do you copy? Nothing but static. I tried again, but the same result. I cursed under my breath and decided to investigate. I followed the direction of the screen, which led me deeper into the forest, away from the marked trails. The trees grew denser, and the light dimmed as the canopy thickened overhead. After about fifteen minutes of hiking, I stumbled upon an old, overgrown path that I hadn't seen before. It looked like it hadn't been used in years. The screams had stopped, but I felt an unsettling silence in the air. I pressed on, hoping to find whoever had made those sounds. Then I saw something that made my blood run cold. A tent, ripped to shreds, with belongings scattered all around. It looked like a small campsite, probably for a couple of hikers. There was blood on the ground, leading away from the campsite. My stomach churned, but I forced myself to follow the trail. The blood led to a small clearing, and that's where I found him. A man, or what was left of him, lay sprawled on the ground. His face was frozen in a mask of horror, eyes wide open, staring at nothing. His body was torn apart, like something had mauled him. I felt bow rising in my throat but swallowed it down. I had to stay focused. There were drag marks leading away from the body, deeper into the woods. Whoever, or whatever, did this might still be out there. I tried the radio again. Ranger Wilcox to base. We have a situation. There's been an attack. I need backup and medical assistance immediately. This time, I got a faint response. Base to Wilcox. Copy that. Backup is on the way. Stay safe. I took a deep breath and continued to follow the drag marks. They led me to a cave entrance, half hidden by overgrown vines and brush. The air around it felt colder, and an unnatural silence hung heavy. I drew my flashlight and stepped inside, my heart pounding in my chest. The cave was dark and damp the air thick with the smell of decay. As I ventured deeper, I heard a faint, raspy breathing. My flashlight beam caught a glimpse of something huddled in the shadows. It looked humanoid but twisted and deformed, with long, spindly limbs and pale, almost translucent skin. Its eyes glowed faintly in the darkness. I froze. The creature didn't move, but I could feel its gaze locked onto me. My mind raced. I had no weapons, just a flashlight and a utility knife. I slowly backed out of the cave, trying to make as little noise as possible. As soon as I was outside, I ran. I didn't stop until I reached the trailhead and could get a clearer signal on my radio. Ranger Wilcox to base. I found the attacker. It's not human. Repeat, it's not human. Do not approach the cave alone. Wait for backup. My voice was shaking, but I didn't care. I waited by the trailhead, my eyes scanning the woods for any sign of movement. It felt like hours before I heard the sound of engines and saw the lights of the park vehicles. Relief washed over me as Janine and a couple of other rangers arrived. Janine took one look at me and knew something was seriously wrong. Zane, what happened? I explained everything as quickly as I could. They were skeptical at first, but the look in my eyes must have convinced them. We moved as a group back towards the cave, weapons drawn and flashlights cutting through the darkness. When we reached the cave, it was empty. No sign of the creature. Just the remnants of what it had dragged inside. Torn clothing, more blood, and a few scattered bones. Janine looked at me, her face pale. We need to get out of here. Now. We retreated back to the trailhead and called in more support. By the time a full search team arrived, 
The sun was setting, casting long shadows through the trees. We searched the area thoroughly but found no trace of the creature. The official report said the hiker was killed by a bear, but I knew that wasn't true. Bears don't drag bodies into caves or leave behind such a mess. I still have nightmares about what I saw that day. The park was closed for a while after the incident, and I took some time off, but I eventually went back to work. Someone had to look out for the people who came to enjoy the beauty of Eldritch State Park. I never told anyone else about the creature, not even my family. I didn't want to be labeled as crazy. But every time I go out on patrol, I carry a gun now, just in case. And I always keep an eye on the shadows, wondering if it's still out there, watching. A few months later, another ranger, Tom, went missing. We found his radio and some of his gear near the same overgrown path I had discovered. No blood this time, just an eerie silence and a sense of dread that hung in the air. The search teams combed the area for days but found no sign of him. It was like he had vanished into thin air. The park authorities decided to close off that section of the forest permanently. They said it was due to safety concerns, but I knew the real reason. Whatever was out there wasn't going to stop. It was hunting us. I still work at the park, but things are different now. I'm always on edge, always alert. I've tried to move on, but it's hard when you know there's something out there, something that defies explanation. I've talked to a few locals, and some of the older folks have whispered stories about strange sightings in the woods tales that go back generations. Maybe they know more than they're letting on, but no one's willing to say it outright. I've thought about leaving, moving somewhere far away, but I can't shake the feeling that it wouldn't matter. This thing, whatever it is, isn't bound by geography. It's out there, lurking in the dark corners of the world, waiting for its next victim. The other rangers and I have a silent understanding now. We don't talk about what happened, but we all carry a little more weight on our shoulders. We look out for each other, and we're more cautious than ever. The park visitors have no idea what's really out there, and maybe that's for the best. Sometimes, late at night when I'm alone in my cabin, I hear noises, faint whispers, the rustle of leaves the creak of the floorboards. I tell myself it's just my imagination, but deep down, I know the truth. The past never really leaves us. It's always there, lurking just out of sight, waiting for the moment when we let our guard down. So, if you ever find yourself in a quiet corner of the world, in a place where the trees grow thick and the shadows seem a little darker, remember this story. Stay on the marked trails, keep your wits about you, and never, ever, venture into the unknown alone. Because you never know what might be waiting in the darkness, watching, and biding its time. I guess that's my story. I don't know if it makes any sense or if anyone will believe it, but it's what happened. And if nothing else, it's a reminder that sometimes, the most terrifying things are the ones we can't explain. Why name is Silas Wainwright? I have been a part of the Cryptid Investigation Unit, a secret government agency, for almost a decade. This is not your average cryptid hunting story. It's real. It's terrifying, and it left a mark that won't fade. In the summer of 2018, we got a call from a small town in Northern California, nestled in the heart of the Redwoods. Crescent City. The locals were used to the forest's mysteries, but something darker was unfolding. I arrived in Crescent City with my partner, Thomas McBride. Tom was a big guy, former Marine, with a laugh that could shake the rafters. 
We had seen a lot together, from supposed chupacabras in Texas to lake monsters in Vermont. This mission felt different right from the start. We met with Sheriff Carla Mendel at the station. She was in her forties, sharp-eyed, and practical. We've had five people go missing in the last month, she said. Two hikers, a local shop owner, and a couple of teenagers. All disappeared without a trace. Tom leaned back in his chair. And you've ruled out the usual explanations? Bears, cougars, folks getting lost? Sheriff Mendel nodded. We've scoured the area. No tracks, no signs of struggle. Just gone. We started our investigation by talking to the families of the missing. They were all local, tight-knit, and terrified. One of the mothers, a woman named Linda Harris, described how her son, Jake, had left to meet his friends by the old logging trail and never came back. He was a good boy, she said, her voice cracking. He'd never run off like this. Tom and I set up base in a cabin near the edge of the forest. It was isolated, perfect for our operations. We had our gear, thermal cameras, motion detectors, a couple of handguns, and a rifle. Tom had a penchant for gadgets, and our cabin soon looked like a makeshift control center. Our first few nights were uneventful. The forest was quiet, almost unnaturally so. We took turns patrolling, but found nothing out of the ordinary. On the fourth night, everything changed. Tom and I were sitting by the fire, talking about the absurdity of our job. You ever think about what you'd be doing if you weren't chasing monsters? Tom asked, grinning. Maybe a writer, I said. Or a fisherman. Something peaceful. Yeah, right, Tom chuckled. You'd get bored in a week. That's when we heard it. A scream. Not an animal, but a human scream, echoing through the trees. We grabbed our rifles and ran towards the sound. We found a campsite torn apart. Blood was splattered on the ground, and in the middle of the clearing, a young woman lay dead. It was one of the missing hikers. Her body was mangled, claw marks deep in her flesh. Tom cursed under his breath. What the hell did this? I shook my head, scanning the perimeter. Whatever it is, it's still out there. We reported back to Sheriff Mendel. She was visibly shaken but composed. We need to find it before it takes anyone else, she said. Over the next few days, we found more signs. Claw marks on trees, strange tracks in the dirt. We even found an old camera with photos of a shadowy figure moving through the forest. It was blurry but it was enough to know we were dealing with something big and dangerous. Then, one night, it came for us. I was on patrol when I heard Tom shout. I rushed back to the cabin to find him fighting for his life against a monstrous creature. It stood on two legs, covered in matted fur, with eyes that glowed in the darkness. It slashed at Tom with claws like knives. I raised my rifle and fired— but the creature was fast. It turned towards me, and I could see the raw, animalistic rage in its eyes. It lunged, and I barely had time to dodge. Tom, bleeding and furious, grabbed his gun and shot at point blank. The creature howled and disappeared into the trees. Tom collapsed, his wounds severe. We need to get you to a hospital. I said, trying to staunch the bleeding. No, Tom gasped. It's still out there. We have to finish this. We were losing daylight, and I knew he was right. If we didn't stop it now, more people would die. I rigged up a makeshift stretcher and dragged Tom with me as we followed the blood trail into the heart of the forest. It was a brutal trek. Tom's breathing was ragged and I could see he was fading. 
but he kept pushing me on, his determination unwavering. We can't let it win, he kept saying. We found the creature's lair in a cave hidden by thick underbrush. The smell of decay was overpowering. Bones littered the ground, human and animal alike. And there, in the dim light, the creature crouched, licking its wounds. I set Tom down and raised my rifle. Hey! I shouted, drawing its attention. It turned, snarling, and charged at me. I fired, hitting it in the shoulder. It staggered but kept coming. Tom, with the last of his strength, pulled his gun and shot it again. The creature faltered, giving me the chance to take aim and put a bullet through its skull. It fell, finally dead. I rushed to Tom's side. He was pale, barely conscious. Did we get it? He whispered. Yeah, we got it. I said, my voice breaking. You did good, Tom. He smiled weakly. Told you we couldn't let it win. Tom didn't make it. He died there in the forest, a hero to the end. I carried his body back to the cabin and called for extraction. Sheriff Mendel and her team met us, their faces grim. The aftermath was a blur. Reports were filed, the area was secured and the official story was that a rogue bear had been responsible. But we knew the truth. I left Crescent City a few days later, the weight of what had happened heavy on my shoulders. Tom's death was a blow, and the reality of our work had never felt more brutal. I think about him often, about the lives we saved and the ones we couldn't. And I remember the creature, the terror in its eyes, and the unrelenting drive to survive, no matter the cost. Our work continues. There are always more monsters to hunt, more mysteries to unravel. But that summer in the redwoods left a scar. It reminded me of the fragility of life and the darkness that lurks just beyond the light. As I write this, I'm sitting by a different fire, in a different forest. The night is quiet, but I know better than to let my guard down. The world is full of shadows, and not all of them are empty. My name is Silas Wainwright, and this is my story. My name is Cal Rutledge, and this happened to me on October 3, 1998. I've been a truck driver for nearly 20 years, hauling goods up and down the East Coast. Most of the time, it's a straightforward job. Drive, deliver, repeat. But every so often, something out of the ordinary happens. This time, it wasn't just out of the ordinary, it was a nightmare. It started like any other day. I picked up a load in Albany, New York bound for a small town in rural Pennsylvania. The route took me through some pretty isolated areas, places where cell service was a joke and the nearest help might be hours away. Not that I minded. I've always enjoyed the solitude. Gives me time to think. I was cruising down a two-lane highway, surrounded by nothing but trees and the occasional farmhouse. It was early afternoon, the sky overcast, the kind of weather that makes everything look a little more dreary. I was making good time, planning to stop at a diner I knew about an hour down the road for a late lunch. I had just rounded a bend when I saw a car on the shoulder, its hood up. A woman was standing beside it, waving her arms. I pulled over, more out of habit than anything. Truckers help each other out. It's just what we do. I climbed down from the cab and walked over. She was in her late thirties, maybe, with short brown hair and a look of genuine relief on her face. Thank God you stopped, she said. My car just died, and I don't have any cell service. Let me take a look, I said. I'm no mechanic, but I know my way around an engine. 
I fiddled with the battery cables, checked the oil, tried to start it up. Nothing. It's dead, I said. I can give you a lift to the next town, though. It's about thirty miles up the road. She hesitated for a second, then nodded. That would be great. I really appreciate it. We climbed into the cab, and she introduced herself as Lisa. We made small talk as we drove, the kind of idle chatter you make with strangers. She was a teacher, on her way to visit her sister. Nice enough lady, seemed genuinely grateful for the ride. About fifteen minutes down the road, we passed a little dirt pull-off. Nothing special about it, just a place where the road widened a bit. But as we went by, something caught my eye. It was quick, just a flash of movement in the trees. I didn't think much of it at first, could have been a deer or a stray dog. But something about it bothered me. It felt off. Did you see that? I asked, more to myself than to her. See what? She replied. Nothing, I said, shaking my head. Probably just an animal. We kept driving, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. A few miles later, we passed another pull-off, and this time I saw it clearly. A man, standing in the trees, watching us. He was wearing a dark jacket and jeans, nothing out of the ordinary, but the way he was standing there, so still, gave me the creeps. I didn't say anything to Lisa. No point in scaring her. But I kept an eye on the rearview mirror, watching for any sign of trouble. We reached the town without incident, and I dropped her off at a gas station. She thanked me again, offered to pay for my lunch or something, but I waved it off. Just doing my job. After she went inside, I parked the truck and walked over to a diner across the street. It was one of those old-school places with vinyl booths and a counter lined with stools. I ordered a burger and a coffee, trying to shake off the weird feeling from earlier. I was halfway through my meal when I saw him. The man from the trees. He walked into the diner like he owned the place, his eyes scanning the room until they landed on me. He didn't smile, didn't nod, just stared. My heart started pounding, but I kept my cool. I dealt with all sorts of people on the road, and the last thing you want to do is show fear. He walked over and sat down at the counter, two seats away from me. Up close, I could see he was older than I'd thought, maybe in his fifties. He had a scar running down the side of his face and his eyes were cold, dead. Nice day for a drive, he said, his voice flat and emotionless. Yeah, I replied, trying to keep it casual. Just another day on the road. He didn't say anything else, just sat there, staring at me. I finished my meal quickly, paid the bill, and left. As I walked back to my truck, I glanced over my shoulder. He was still sitting there, watching me through the window. I climbed into the cab and locked the doors, my mind racing. Who was this guy? Why was he following me? I started the engine and pulled out of the lot, my eyes constantly flicking to the mirrors. I didn't see him again, but the feeling of being watched stayed with me. I drove for another hour, my nerves on edge, until I reached a rest area. It was one of those places with a few picnic tables and a bathroom, nothing fancy. I pulled in, parked, and got out to stretch my legs. The place was empty, just me and the trees. I was about to climb back into the cab when I heard a noise. A twig snapping, maybe, or a footstep. I turned, scanning the tree line, but saw nothing. Just the wind, I told myself but I couldn't shake the feeling that I wasn't alone. I climbed back into the truck, locked the doors, and settled in for the night. I always carry a baseball bat with me, just in case, 
and I pulled it out from behind the seat, laying it across my lap. I didn't sleep much, every little noise outside making me jump. Sometime in the early morning, just before dawn, I heard it. A soft tap on the window, like someone was trying to get my attention. I froze, my hand tightening around the bat. The tapping came again, more insistent this time. I took a deep breath and slowly turned my head. There, standing right outside the window, was the man from the diner. His face was inches from the glass, his eyes staring straight into mine. He didn't move, didn't blink, just stood there. I reacted without thinking. I swung the bat at the window, shattering the glass. He jumped back, and I scrambled to open the door, ready to fight. But he was gone, vanished into the trees. I didn't waste any time. I started the engine and floored it, not caring about the noise or the damage. I drove like a madman, my heart pounding, until I reached a larger town with a police station. I stumbled inside, barely able to speak. The officers were skeptical at first, another trucker with a crazy story but they sent a car to the rest area to check it out. They found the broken window, but no sign of the man. I filed a report, gave them all the details, but I knew it wouldn't do much good. This guy was smart, careful. He'd vanish into the woods and reappear somewhere else, a ghost on the highway. For weeks, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. Every time I stopped... I scanned the area, half expecting to see him lurking in the shadows. I started carrying a gun, something I'd never felt the need for before. I heard from other truckers about strange encounters, people going missing, stories that made my skin crawl. I don't know if any of them were connected to the man I saw, but it made me wary, cautious. Eventually, the fear faded, replaced by a kind of grim acceptance. The road is dangerous, always has been. You take your chances, keep your wits about you, and hope for the best. But I never forgot that face, those cold, dead eyes. And I know, somewhere out there, he's still watching, still waiting. My name is Wyatt Killian, and this happened to me on July 15, 1998. I worked as a search and rescue officer in the dense forests of northern Idaho. My team and I were called out to find a missing hiker, Dave Mattingly, who had been out for two days with no sign of returning. We got the call around 7 a.m., and by 8.30, we were deep into the woods. The area was rugged, with thick underbrush and towering pines. It wasn't a popular spot, mainly frequented by locals who knew how to navigate its labyrinthine paths Dave had set out on his hike alone, according to his wife. He was experienced but had a habit of wandering off the main trails. His wife, Marcy, mentioned that he always carried a pocket knife and a small first aid kit but nothing more. No gun, no radio. We geared up with the usual, radios, first aid kits, maps, and my trusty bowie knife. I didn't carry a gun, never really felt the need for one in these parts. Bears and cougars were rare, and a knife usually sufficed for protection. My team consisted of three other guys, Bob Murdoch, a burly ex-marine with a knack for finding trails, Charlie Benson, a lean guy with the stamina of a marathon runner, and Eric Turner, the rookie, eager but green. We split into two groups. Bob and I took the northern route, while Charlie and Eric headed south. We agreed to rendezvous at a clearing known as Pine Ridge by noon. It was a steep climb, and Bob and I pushed through, occasionally calling out Dave's name. By 10 a.m., we found our first clue— a torn piece of fabric caught on a branch. 
It matched the description of the shirt Dave was wearing. We radioed Charlie and Eric, letting them know we might be onto something. As we moved deeper, the forest grew eerily quiet. Bob joked about how it felt like we were being watched. I laughed it off, but something about the silence didn't sit right with me. It wasn't long before we stumbled upon a small campsite. There were signs of a struggle, scattered gear, an overturned pot, and a bloodstain on the ground. It wasn't a lot, but enough to make my stomach churn. We called it in and started searching the area more thoroughly. Bob found a trail of blood drops leading away from the campsite. We followed it for about half a mile before the drops became smears and then disappeared altogether. It was close to noon, so we headed to Pine Ridge to meet up with Charlie and Eric. When we got there, Charlie was pacing, looking worried. Eric was missing. Charlie said they had found another clue, an abandoned backpack but Eric had insisted on checking a nearby cave by himself and hadn't come back. We decided to check out the cave together. It wasn't far, maybe a fifteen-minute hike. The entrance was narrow, but we squeezed through, calling out for Eric. Inside, the cave was dark and musty, the air thick with the smell of damp earth. About thirty feet in, we found Eric. He was on the ground, unconscious but breathing. He had a nasty gash on his head, and his radio was smashed. Bob and I lifted him, while Charlie kept an eye out for any signs of what had attacked him. We couldn't be sure if he fell or if something else had happened. We made a makeshift stretcher and began the slow trek back to the nearest ranger station. It was a grueling hike, especially with Eric's added weight. We had to move carefully, but we made decent time, arriving just before dark. Eric was rushed to the hospital. The rest of us regrouped to plan our next move. With one man down, the search for Dave took on a new sense of urgency. The blood and the struggle at the campsite indicated he was in serious trouble. The next day, we brought in reinforcements— a few more guys from the county and a couple of volunteers who knew the area well. We divided into three groups and spread out. My group focused on the area around the cave, combing through every inch. Around mid-morning, we found another clue, Dave's pocket knife, half buried in the dirt. The blade was bent, and the handle was sticky with what looked like blood. It was a bad sign but it also meant we were close. We pushed forward, following a faint trail through the underbrush. The forest was thick, making it hard to see more than a few feet ahead. That's when we heard it, a low, guttural noise that sent shivers down my spine. Bob, who was leading, froze and motioned for us to stop. The noise came again, closer this time. We crouched peering through the foliage. In the dim light, we could make out a shape moving among the trees. It was large, hulking, and definitely not human. Bob whispered for us to back away slowly, but just as we started to retreat, the thing charged. It barreled through the underbrush with terrifying speed. Bob managed to get off a shot with his flare gun, the bright light momentarily blinding it. We ran. The thing roared an awful, bone-chilling sound and gave chase. We scattered, each of us sprinting in different directions. I didn't look back, just ran as fast as I could, branches whipping at my face. I stumbled into a clearing, panting and trying to catch my breath. The forest was silent again, except for my own ragged breathing. I had no idea where the others were or if they had made it out. My radio was still working, so I called for backup, giving them my coordinates. I heard rustling behind me and spun around, my knife at the ready. It was Bob, limping but alive. He had a deep gash on his leg, but he was grinning, relieved to see me. 
We didn't have time to chat. We needed to get back to the ranger station. The trek back was agonizingly slow, with Bob barely able to walk. I had to support most of his weight, but we made it. The others were already there, battered but alive. Charlie had a broken arm, and one of the volunteers was missing, presumably taken by the creature. We radioed for more help and set up a perimeter around the station. It was going to be a long night. We took turns keeping watch, guns and flares at the ready. The creature didn't come that night, but we could hear it in the distance, its haunting cries echoing through the forest. By morning, the reinforcements arrived. They brought heavier firepower and more men. We went back into the forest, determined to find Dave and put an end to whatever was out there. It took two more days of relentless searching before we found him. Dave's body was in a small ravine, covered in scratches and bite marks. He had put up a fight, but he didn't stand a chance against the creature. We radioed it in and carefully carried his body back to the station. The authorities were called, and the area was closed off. They conducted an investigation, but officially, they never found the creature. Unofficially, they told us it was likely a bear, though none of us believed it. Bears didn't move like that, didn't hunt like that. Eric recovered from his injuries but never came back to search and rescue. Charlie took a desk job, and Bob retired early. As for me, I stayed on, but I never went back to that part of the forest. There are places in this world that are best left alone, and that was one of them. Sometimes, late at night, I still hear its cries in my dreams. And I know that out there, in those dark woods, something waits. My name is Ambrose Vick and this happened to me in 1997. You know... I never thought much about the things that could go wrong in my line of work. Being a Navy SEAL, you train, you prepare, and you execute. It's all about discipline and precision. But there's no manual for the kind of hell I walked into that night. I was on a classified mission in the outskirts of Kalapapa, Hawaii. The terrain was rugged, unforgiving, but that's what we were trained for. The mission was simple enough, extract a high-value target who had gone silent for too long. It was supposed to be in and out, no fuss. I was with my team, Travis Huxley, Joel Ward, and Marcus Flynn. We were tight, like brothers, each of us knowing the other's moves before they made them. We landed near a dense forest, the kind that made you feel like you were stepping into another world. The air was thick with humidity, and the only sounds were the occasional rustle of leaves and the distant crash of waves. We moved quickly, quietly, making our way towards the coordinates we had. The target was supposed to be in an old, abandoned research facility. The kind of place you wouldn't want to be caught dead in. Travis was the first to notice something off. You guys see that? He whispered pointing towards a faint light flickering through the trees. We moved in closer, and that's when we heard it, a low, eerie hum, like machinery grinding in the distance. It sent a shiver through me, but we pressed on. We reached the facility, and it looked like it hadn't been touched in decades. Rusted gates, broken windows, the whole nine yards. We split up, standard procedure, Marcus and I took the left wing while Joel and Travis headed right. The place was a maze of corridors and rooms, most of them empty or filled with old, decaying equipment. It smelled like mildew and something else, something metallic. Marcus and I found nothing out of the ordinary until we hit the basement. That's where things got weird. The basement was partially flooded, and the water was this murky brown color. We waded through it, 
trying to be as quiet as possible. That's when we found the first body. It was floating face down, bloated and unrecognizable. Marcus went to check for a pulse out of habit, even though we both knew it was pointless. Damn, Marcus muttered, standing up. What the hell happened here? Before I could answer, we heard a scream echo through the halls. It was Joel. We ran towards the sound, splashing through the water, hearts pounding. When we got to the source, we found Joel and Travis standing in a large room, their faces pale. There were more bodies, all in various stages of decay. Some looked like they had been there for years, others more recent. What the hell is this place? Joel asked, his voice shaking. I didn't have an answer. We needed to find the target and get the hell out of there. We pressed on, deeper into the facility. That's when we found the room. It was large, with walls lined with strange, alien-looking symbols. In the center was a makeshift altar, and on it lay our target, strapped down and unconscious. We moved quickly to free him, but as we did, the lights flickered and the temperature dropped. I felt a presence, something dark and malevolent. Marcus screamed, and I turned to see a figure standing in the doorway. It was tall, unnaturally so, with long, spindly limbs and a face that seemed to shift and change. It had no eyes, just dark, empty sockets. Before we could react, it moved. Faster than anything I'd ever seen. It grabbed Travis and threw him against the wall with such force that I heard his neck snap. He dropped like a ragdoll, lifeless. Joel fired his weapon, the shots echoing in the room, but the thing didn't even flinch. It moved towards Joel, and I watched in horror as it ripped him apart, blood spraying everywhere. Marcus and I ran, dragging the target with us. We didn't look back. We made it out of the facility, but the thing was still on our heels. It was like a nightmare, running through that dark forest, knowing that thing was right behind us. We made it to the extraction point, and the chopper was there, thank God. We got the target on board and took off, but Marcus didn't make it. The thing grabbed him just as we were lifting off. I saw the look of terror on his face before he disappeared into the trees. We reported what happened, but no one believed us. They chalked it up to stress, hallucinations, anything but the truth. The official story was that the target had been rescued, but at a great cost. Travis, Joel, and Marcus were listed as Kia. But I know what I saw. And I know that thing is still out there. I left the seals not long after that. Couldn't do it anymore. I moved to a small town in Oregon, trying to put it all behind me. But some nights, when it's quiet, I can still hear that hum. And I know it's only a matter of time before it finds me again. Life after the seals was a struggle. I took up odd jobs, anything to keep my mind occupied. Construction, bartending, even worked as a mechanic for a while. It helped, but only a little. The nightmares were the worst. Reliving that night over and over again. Seeing my friends die in such a gruesome way. I turned to the bottle more than I should have, trying to drown out the memories. But it never worked for long. I met a woman, Clara, who managed to bring some light back into my life. She had this way of making me forget, even if just for a little while. We got married, had a couple of kids, and for a while, things were good. Normal. But you can't outrun your past forever. One night, I was sitting on the porch, enjoying the quiet. The kids were asleep, and Clara was inside reading. That's when I heard it. The hum. Faint, but unmistakable. My heart sank. I knew what it meant. I went inside, trying to stay calm. 
Clara looked up from her book, saw the look on my face. What's wrong? she asked. Nothing, I lied. Just thought I heard something outside. She didn't believe me, but she did impress. I kissed her good night and told her I was going for a walk. I needed to clear my head, figure out what to do. As I walked through the woods behind our house, the hum grew louder. I could feel it, like a physical presence, pressing down on me. That's when I saw it. The same tall, spindly figure from all those years ago. It was standing at the edge of the trees, watching me. My first instinct was to run, but I knew it wouldn't do any good. Instead, I stood my ground. What do you want? I yelled. My voice sounded weak, even to me. It didn't answer, just took a step closer. I could see its face, those empty sockets staring right through me. I pulled out the knife I always carried, more out of habit than anything else. I knew it wouldn't do any good, but it made me feel a little better. The thing moved faster than I could react. It was on me in an instant, knocking the knife from my hand and pinning me to the ground. I struggled, but it was like fighting against a mountain. It leaned in close, and I could feel its breath, cold and fetid. You can't have them. I managed to choke out. You can't have my family. It didn't respond, just stared at me with those empty sockets. Then, just as suddenly as it had appeared, it was gone. I lay there for a long time, trying to catch my breath. When I finally got up, I made my way back to the house, shaken but determined. I wouldn't let it take my family. I'd fight it with everything I had. I spent the next few weeks preparing. I didn't know if it would come back, but I had to be ready. I reinforced the house, set up traps, anything I could think of. Clara knew something was wrong, but I couldn't bring myself to tell her the whole truth. Just that we were in danger and I needed to protect us. The nights were the hardest. Every sound, every creak of the house set me on edge. But the hum didn't come back, and after a while, I started to hope that maybe, just maybe, it was over. Then, one night, it all went to hell. I was in the basement, checking the traps, when I heard Clara scream. I ran upstairs, heart pounding, and found her standing in the living room, eyes wide with terror. The kids were gone. I looked around, frantic but there was no sign of them. The front door was wide open, and I knew. It had taken them. I grabbed my gear and ran into the woods, following the faint sound of the hum. I didn't stop, didn't think, just ran. The forest seemed to close in around me, the darkness pressing down. Finally, I came to a clearing, and there they were. The thing was holding them, one in each arm, and they were unconscious. I raised my gun, hands shaking. Let them go! I shouted. It turned to me, those empty sockets seeming to bore into my soul. Slowly, it lowered the kids to the ground. I moved closer, keeping my gun trained on it. What do you want? I demanded. It didn't answer, just stood there, watching me. I moved to the kids, keeping one eye on the thing. They were breathing, thank God, but they wouldn't wake up. I felt a surge of anger. This thing had taken everything from me. I wasn't going to let it win. With a roar, I charged at it, firing my gun. The bullets seemed to have no effect, but I kept firing, kept moving. I tackled it, and we went down in a tangle of limbs. It was strong, but so was I. We struggled, rolling across the ground, each trying to gain the upper hand. Finally, I managed to get my knife. I plunged it into the thing's chest, over and over. It let out a strange, hollow sound, like wind through a cave, and then it went still. 
I pushed myself up, panting, and looked at its lifeless form. It was over. I gathered the kids and carried them back to the house. Clara was waiting, tears streaming down her face. We held each other for a long time, not saying a word. The kids woke up the next morning, none the worse for wear. They didn't remember a thing, and I was grateful for that. We moved after that, far away from those woods. I couldn't risk it happening again. I never told anyone the full story, not even Clara. Some things are better left unsaid. But I'll never forget that night. And I know, deep down, that it's not really over. It never is. My name is Ezekiel Rossetti, and I'll never forget the night of August 7, 1994. Back then, I was just a regular guy living in a small town in Montana called Dunmore. It's one of those places where everyone knows each other, and nothing much happens except the occasional rowdy high school football game or the county fair. I worked as a mechanic at Bill's Auto Shop, loved fishing on weekends, and spent most evenings watching TV with my wife, Clara. Clara and I had been married for ten years. We met in high school, fell in love, and got hitched as soon as I could afford a small house. Life was simple and we liked it that way. We didn't have kids yet, but we were working on it. Our neighbors, the Campbells, had three little ones, and they were always running around our yard, kicking up dust and giggling. It felt like we were part of one big family. One night, Clara had gone to visit her sister in Bozeman. She'd be back in a couple of days, so I decided to have a quiet evening with a couple of beers and a baseball game on TV. Around ten, I heard a knock on the door. It was unusual, considering how everyone in Dunmore knew not to bother folks after dark unless it was important. I opened the door to see a young boy, maybe ten or eleven, with pale skin and jet black eyes. He looked up at me, those eyes staring straight through me. Hey there, kid. What's up? I asked, trying to sound casual, though a chill ran through me. Can I use your phone? His voice was flat, almost robotic. I hesitated. Something about him wasn't right. Kids around here didn't roam the streets at night alone. Ah, uh, where are your parents? I asked. He didn't answer. Just stood there, staring. Look, kid, it's late. Maybe you should head home. I started to close the door, but he moved forward, his small hand pressing against the wood. Please let me in, he insisted, his voice unwavering. I'd seen enough movies to know this was the part where the smart guy shuts the door and locks it. So, that's what I did. I turned the lock and stepped back watching through the peephole as he just stood there, staring at the door. After a few minutes, he turned and walked away. I let out a breath I didn't know I was holding. Trying to shake off the unease, I grabbed another beer and sat back down. But I couldn't focus on the game. Those black eyes haunted me. About an hour later, I decided to call it a night. As I headed to bed, I checked all the locks, something I hadn't done since we first moved in. The next day, Clara called to check in. I told her about the strange kid, but she just laughed it off, saying I was probably imagining things after too many beers. Maybe she was right, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. Two nights later, Clara was still in Bozeman and I was out back grilling some steaks when I heard rustling from the woods behind our house. It wasn't unusual to hear animals, but this sounded different, like someone, or something, moving through the brush. I grabbed my flashlight and pointed it toward the noise. Hello? 
Anyone there? I called out. No answer. I walked a bit closer to the edge of the woods, my heart pounding. That's when I saw them. Two more kids, a boy and a girl, both with the same pale skin and black eyes, standing just beyond the tree line. Hey! What are you kids doing out here? I shouted, my voice more aggressive than I intended. The girl stepped forward. We're lost. Can you help us? I didn't buy it for a second. You kids need to get home. It's not safe out here. Please, the boy echoed. Let us in. That was enough for me. I backed up slowly, never taking my eyes off them, and went inside, locking the door behind me. I called the sheriff's office, but by the time Deputy Harlan arrived, the kids were gone. He took my statement but seemed skeptical. Probably just some pranksters, he said. Kids these days, you know? I didn't sleep much that night, and the next day at work, I couldn't focus. Bill noticed and asked if I was all right. I told him about the kids, but he just laughed and said I needed a vacation. Maybe he was right. Things took a darker turn that weekend. Clara was still away, so I decided to check in on the Campbells. Their kids always cheered me up. When I knocked, there was no answer, which was strange. They never went anywhere without telling me to keep an eye on the house. I peered through the window and saw their living room was a mess. Toys were scattered, and the front door was slightly ajar. My gut told me something was very wrong. I called out, but no one answered. I pushed the door open and stepped inside. The house was eerily quiet. John? Linda? You guys here? I called out. Silence. I walked through the house, every step echoing in the emptiness. I found Linda in the kitchen, her face pale, eyes wide open, staring at nothing. She wasn't breathing. My heart raced as I checked for a pulse, but she was gone. I backed away, bumping into the table, knocking over a chair. Panic set in. I ran upstairs and found John in the bedroom, the same lifeless expression on his face. The kids were nowhere to be seen. I grabbed the phone and dialed 911, my hands shaking. The operator tried to calm me down, but my mind was racing. What the hell happened here? The sheriff and his team arrived quickly. They took my statement, searched the house, but found no signs of the kids. The whole town was in shock. We didn't have murders in Dunmore, let alone kids going missing. That night, I stayed up, clutching the shotgun I kept for emergencies. Every sound made me jump. Around midnight, there was another knock at the door. My blood ran cold. I approached the door cautiously, peering through the peephole. It was another kid, a boy, with those same black eyes. I didn't open the door this time. Go away! I shouted, my voice cracking. Please let me in. I'm lost, he said, his voice eerily calm. No way. Get out of here! I backed away from the door, keeping the shotgun trained on it. The knocking continued for a while, then stopped. I didn't sleep at all, just sat there, waiting for something to happen. When morning came, I called Clara and told her to stay in Bozeman. It wasn't safe here. Over the next few days, the town was on edge. People reported seeing strange kids with black eyes but no one knew who they were or where they came from. The Campbell's kids were still missing, and the sheriff had no leads. I decided to do some digging myself. I spent hours at the library, looking for anything about these kids. I found old newspaper articles about similar sightings in other parts of the country, but no real answers. The stories all ended the same way, missing persons, unsolved cases. 
One evening, as I was sifting through old files, I found an article about a small town in Texas that had experienced the same thing back in the 70s. The townspeople had reported seeing kids with black eyes just before a series of disappearances. It all sounded too familiar. I reached out to a retired sheriff from that town, a guy named Earl. He was reluctant to talk at first, but eventually he opened up. Those kids ain't kids, he said. There's something else, something evil. We never figured out what they were or where they came from, but once they showed up, people disappeared. Best thing you can do is get out of there. I didn't want to believe him, but deep down, I knew he was right. I tried to convince Clara to stay in Bozeman a while longer, but she insisted on coming home. She missed me, and she didn't believe in the supernatural. I didn't know how to explain it to her without sounding crazy. When she got back, I kept a close eye on her, never letting her out of my sight. We boarded up the windows, locked the doors, and waited. For what I didn't know. A few nights later, we heard it again. The knocking. Clara looked at me, confused. Who could that be at this hour? I grabbed the shotgun and motioned for her to stay back. I peeked through the peephole. There were three of them this time, two boys and a girl, all with those black, soulless eyes. Ezekiel, what's going on? Clara whispered, her voice trembling. Stay back, I ordered my voice firm. Don't open the door. They knocked again, harder this time. Please let us in. We're lost. Go away! I shouted, my finger hovering over the trigger. The girl stepped forward, her face almost pressed against the door. Let us in, Ezekiel. My heart skipped a beat. How did they know my name? Clara looked at me, her eyes wide with fear. Ezekiel, what do we do? I didn't have an answer. We stayed there, frozen, as the knocking continued. Eventually, it stopped. We didn't sleep that night, just sat there, waiting for something to happen. The next day, I went to the sheriff and told him everything. He looked at me like I was crazy but promised to keep an eye on things. I knew he didn't believe me, but I didn't care. I had to protect Clara. That night, we heard the knocks again, but this time, they didn't stop. They pounded on the door, the windows, the walls. It was like they were trying to get in from every direction. Clara clung to me, her body trembling. Ezekiel, we have to do something, she pleaded. I tightened my grip on the shotgun. We stay put. They can't get in if we don't let them. The pounding grew louder, more frantic. I could hear their voices, whispering, chanting. It was maddening. Clara started to cry, and I felt helpless. I didn't know how to stop them. Then, as suddenly as it started, it stopped. The silence was deafening. We stayed there, waiting for what felt like hours. When the sun finally came up, we were exhausted but alive. I knew we couldn't stay in Dunmore. We packed our bags and left that morning, not bothering to say goodbye to anyone. We drove to Bozeman, hoping to find some semblance of safety there. For a while, things were quiet. We rented a small apartment and tried to move on with our lives. But the memory of those black-eyed kids haunted me. I couldn't shake the feeling that they were still out there, waiting. A few weeks later, I got a call from Deputy Harlan. They'd found the Campbell's kids, or what was left of them, in the woods. Their bodies were mutilated, almost unrecognizable. The sheriff ruled it as an animal attack, but I knew better. Clara and I moved again, this time to a big city where we hoped to get lost in the crowd. We never spoke of Dunmore or the black-eyed kids again, but the fear lingered. 
I kept a shotgun by the bed and checked the locks every night. Years passed, and we tried to live a normal life. We had a daughter, Emily, and I made sure she knew never to talk to strangers, especially kids with black eyes. Clara thought I was being paranoid, but she humored me. One night, Emily came running into our room, her face pale. Daddy, there's someone at the window. My heart sank. I grabbed the shotgun and rushed to her room. There, standing outside the window, was a boy with black eyes staring at us. I pulled the trigger, shattering the glass, but when I looked again, he was gone. We packed up and left that night, moving across the country. I don't know if we'll ever be safe but I'll do whatever it takes to protect my family. The black-eyed kids are out there, and they're not going away. And that's my story. I wish I could say it has a happy ending, but the truth is, we're still running. Maybe one day, we'll find a place where they can't follow. Until then, we'll keep moving, always looking over our shoulders, waiting for the next knock at the door. My name is Oren Hanks, and this is a story I've never told anyone before. It happened back in 2003 when I was living in a small town in the Midwest. I was working at a local hardware store, which wasn't exactly my dream job, but it paid the bills and kept me busy. On weekends I'd unwind by fishing at this secluded lake a few miles out of town. The place was peaceful, perfect for clearing my head. One Friday evening, I decided to go on one of my fishing trips. I packed my gear, grabbed a couple of sandwiches, and set off in my old beat-up truck. The drive to the lake took about an hour, and as usual, I didn't see another soul on the road. That's the charm of living in the sticks, I suppose. No traffic, no noise, just you and nature. By the time I got there, the sun was dipping below the horizon, casting long shadows across the water. I settled into my usual spot on the lake's edge, cast my line, and cracked open a beer. The fish weren't biting much, but I didn't care. It was more about the solitude and the quiet than the catch. I must have been there for a couple of hours when I heard it, rustling in the bushes behind me. At first, I thought it was a raccoon or a deer, but then I caught sight of something moving. It was low to the ground, slinking closer. I turned to get a better look, but whatever it was, it stayed hidden in the brush. Hey, who's there? I called out, half expecting it to be one of the local kids messing around. But there was no answer, just more rustling. I shook it off and went back to my fishing. I wasn't about to let some noise ruin my evening. A little while later, I decided to call it a night. I packed up my gear and started heading back to the truck. That's when I felt it, a prickle on the back of my neck, like I was being watched. I glanced around, but the forest was dark and still. I picked up my pace feeling a bit more uneasy with each step. As I reached my truck, I heard footsteps, slow and deliberate, crunching the gravel behind me. My heart started to race. I fumbled with my keys, dropped them, and cursed under my breath. When I finally managed to unlock the door and get inside, I locked it immediately and looked back. For a moment, I saw a pair of eyes shining in the darkness, reflecting the moonlight. Then they were gone. I laughed at myself, trying to shake off the fear. Get a grip, Orin, I muttered. It's probably just an animal. But deep down, I knew it wasn't. I drove home with my nerves on edge, constantly checking the rearview mirror. The next day at work, I couldn't focus. My mind kept wandering back to the lake and those eyes in the dark. I told my buddy Clay, 
about it during our lunch break. Clay was a big guy, ex-military, and nothing ever seemed to faze him. Maybe it was a coyote, he suggested. They can look pretty eerie at night. Yeah, maybe, I said, though I wasn't convinced. Coyotes don't usually come that close to people, especially when there's no food around. That evening, I decided to go back to the lake. Part of me wanted to prove that there was nothing to be afraid of, but another part of me was just plain curious. I brought a flashlight and my hunting knife, just in case. When I got there, the place looked just as it did the night before, calm and serene. I sat by the water, flashlight in hand, and waited. Hours passed, and nothing happened. I started to feel silly for being so paranoid. But then, just as I was about to leave, I heard it again, the rustling. This time, it was closer, more deliberate. I stood up, shining my flashlight towards the noise. The beam caught a figure moving through the trees. It was tall, much taller than any animal I'd ever seen, and it moved with a strange, almost human-like gait. Who's there? I called out, my voice shaky. The figure stopped, then slowly turned towards me. For a split second, I saw its face, elongated, with eyes that seemed to glow in the dark. It wasn't human, but it wasn't an animal either. It was something else, something I couldn't quite comprehend. I didn't wait to find out more. I bolted from my truck, heart pounding. As I drove away, I could see it in my rearview mirror, standing at the edge of the forest, watching me. Back in town, I went straight to Clay's place. He opened the door, took one look at my face, and knew something was wrong. Jesus, Oren, you look like you've seen a ghost, he said. Not a ghost, I replied, still catching my breath. Something worse. I told him everything, every detail I could remember. Clay listened, his expression growing more serious by the minute. All right, he said when I finished. Tomorrow night we go back. Together. The next night, Clay and I headed to the lake, armed with flashlights and his old hunting rifle. We arrived just as the sun was setting. Clay, ever the practical one, took the lead, scanning the area with his flashlight. For a while, it was quiet. Then, just like before, we heard the rustling. Clay raised his rifle and we slowly moved towards the noise. The figure appeared again, moving through the trees. Clay aimed his flashlight at it, and we both froze. The creature stepped into the light, revealing its full form. It stood on two legs, covered in coarse, dark fur. Its face was a grotesque mix of human and wolf, with sharp, elongated teeth and those same glowing eyes. It let out a low, guttural snarl, and my blood ran cold. Stay back, Clay warned, his voice steady but tense. The creature took a step forward, and Clay fired. The shot echoed through the forest, and the creature let out a howl of pain before disappearing into the darkness. We need to get out of here, Clay said, pulling me back towards the truck. Now. We drove back to town in silence both of us trying to process what we had just seen. It didn't make any sense. How could something like that exist? The next few days were a blur. Clay and I agreed not to tell anyone about what happened. Who would believe us, anyway? But I couldn't shake the feeling that it wasn't over. That creature was still out there, and I had a sinking feeling it wasn't going to stop. A week later... News broke that a hiker had gone missing near the lake. Search parties were organized, but they found no trace of him. I knew in my gut that the creature had something to do with it, but I kept my mouth shut. Clay and I drifted apart after that. He didn't want to talk about it, and honestly, neither did I. 
But the nightmares didn't stop. I'd see those glowing eyes in the darkness, hear that low snarl echoing in my ears. I tried to move on, but it was always there, lurking in the back of my mind. Years passed, and I eventually moved away from that town, hoping to leave the memories behind. But every now and then, I'd hear about another missing person near that lake, and I'd wonder if it was still out there, watching, waiting. I've never been back to that lake, and I don't plan to. Some things are better left alone. But sometimes, late at night, I'll catch myself staring into the darkness, half expecting to see those eyes again. And every time, I tell myself the same thing. It was just a bad dream, a trick of the mind. But deep down, I know better. Maybe someday, someone will find out what's really out there. Maybe they'll put an end to it once and for all. But until then, I'll keep my distance and hope that whatever it is, it stays far, far away. That's my story. Believe it or not, it's up to you. But I'll tell you this much. There are things in this world we can't explain, things that defy all logic and reason. And sometimes, it's better not to go looking for answers. Because you might not like what you find. My name is Curtis Vance, and I've been a park ranger for the past 15 years. I'd always loved the outdoors, spending my days patrolling the vast expanses of the national park, maintaining trails, and ensuring that visitors enjoyed their experience safely. I was born and raised in a small town in Montana, where my father used to take me hiking and fishing every chance he got. He passed on his love for nature to me, and I found my calling as a park ranger. It's a job that keeps me on my feet and lets me breathe in the fresh mountain air every day. What more could a guy want, right? Well, let me tell you about this one day that changed everything. It was a routine Tuesday. I remember because I had just grabbed a cup of coffee from Marge's Diner, best coffee in town hands down. I was out on the east side of the park, an area that doesn't get many visitors. It's quiet, which I like. I was supposed to check on some of the remote cabins and make sure they were locked up for the season. It's a beautiful part of the park, but it's also where people go missing sometimes. Nothing too mysterious, usually just folks getting lost or injured. We always find them, though, one way or another. I had just finished checking the first cabin and was on my way to the second one. The trail was pretty overgrown, which was unusual because we keep those paths clear. I made a mental note to send someone out there to trim it back. As I walked, I heard something odd. It wasn't the usual rustling of leaves or the chirping of birds. It was more like a whispering sound, almost like someone talking very softly. Hello? I called out, thinking maybe it was a hiker in trouble. No response. I moved forward cautiously, the whispering growing louder but still indistinct. I couldn't make out any words, just the tone. It was eerie. The kind of sound that makes the hairs on the back of your neck stand up. I pushed through the underbrush and found myself in a small clearing. At first, I didn't see anything out of the ordinary. But then I noticed something shiny on the ground. It was a small silver locket, the kind you'd give to someone you love. I picked it up, and as I did, I heard that whispering again, louder this time, and coming from all directions. I'm not one to get spooked easily but I felt an unsettling chill. I clipped the locket to my belt and decided to head back to the ranger station. I figured I could look into it later, maybe see if it belonged to someone who had gone missing. But as I turned to leave, I saw it. At first, I thought it was a person, but it wasn't. It was humanoid in shape but taller, 
much taller, with long limbs and a pale, almost translucent skin. Its eyes were large and dark, and it had no mouth. It just stood there, staring at me. I froze, not sure if I was seeing things or if this was some kind of prank. But it felt too real to be a joke. Who are you? I asked, my voice barely more than a whisper. It didn't answer. It just tilted its head, as if studying me. Then it took a step forward. I backed up, tripping over a root and falling hard on my back. By the time I scrambled to my feet, it was gone. Vanished into thin air. I ran back to my truck, not looking back. I radioed in telling my colleague Mark Randall that I'd seen something strange and was heading back. Mark is a good guy, former military, not one to panic. He told me to stay calm and that he'd meet me at the station. When I got back, Mark was already there, waiting with a concerned look on his face. I told him everything, showed him the locket. He examined it, his brow furrowed. This looks old he said. Really old. We should take it to the sheriff, see if it matches any missing persons reports. We drove to the sheriff's office in town. Sheriff Daniels was an old friend of my dad's, a no-nonsense type who didn't believe in the supernatural or anything like that. When we showed him the locket, he nodded. I remember this, he said belonged to a girl who went missing about twenty years ago. Her name was Emily Stokes. She was hiking with her parents and vanished without a trace. We never found her. Hearing that sent a shiver down my spine. I knew the park had its share of disappearances, but to be holding something that belonged to one of those lost souls was unsettling. Do you think it's connected? I asked. To what I saw? The sheriff sighed. I don't know, Curtis. We've had strange reports from that part of the park for years. People seeing things, hearing things. But nothing we could ever pin down. Maybe it's time we look deeper into it. Mark and I headed back to the park, the sun setting behind the mountains. The drive was quiet, both of us lost in thought. When we got back, we decided to camp out near the clearing where I'd found the locket. We wanted to see if we could find any clues or if the creature would show itself again. We set up camp, built a fire, and waited. The night was still, the only sounds the crackling of the fire and the occasional rustle of leaves. Hours passed, and nothing happened. I was beginning to think I'd imagined the whole thing. Then, just as I was about to call it a night, we heard it. The whispering. Mark's eyes widened, and he grabbed his flashlight, scanning the trees. Do you hear that? he asked. Yeah, I replied, my voice tense. It's the same sound from before. We stood up, moving towards the edge of the clearing. The whispering grew louder, more insistent. And then we saw it. The same creature, standing just at the edge of the firelight, watching us. This time, there was no mistaking it for a person. It was otherworldly, its eyes reflecting the flames like black mirrors. Mark raised his rifle, aiming at the creature. Stay back, he shouted. The creature didn't move. It just stood there, staring at us. Then... In a swift motion, it darted forward. Mark fired, the shot echoing through the trees. But it was too fast. It was on him in an instant, knocking him to the ground. I rushed forward, tackling the creature, trying to pull it off him. Its skin was cold and slick, and it was incredibly strong. It flung me aside like I was nothing. I hit the ground hard the wind knocked out of me. When I looked up, Mark was struggling, the creature's long fingers wrapped around his throat. I scrambled to my feet, 
grabbing a fallen branch and swinging it at the creature with all my might. The branch connected, and the creature let out a sound that was somewhere between a hiss and a screech. It released Mark, turning its attention to me. Mark gasped for breath, his face pale. Curtis, get out of here, he choked out. I wasn't about to leave him. I swung the branch again, but the creature dodged, moving with an unnatural speed. It lashed out, its claws raking across my chest. I felt a sharp pain and warm blood seeping through my shirt. I stumbled back, trying to stay on my feet. The creature advanced, and I knew I had to do something, or we were both dead. I reached for my belt, pulling out my knife. It wasn't much, but it was better than nothing. The creature lunged at me, and I thrust the knife forward, aiming for its chest. The blade sank in, and the creature let out that horrible screech again, this time louder and more pained. It stumbled back, the knife still embedded in its chest. I didn't wait to see what would happen next. I grabbed Mark, pulling him to his feet, and we ran. We didn't stop until we reached the truck, both of us panting and bleeding. I started the engine, and we sped back to the ranger station. Once we were safe inside, I called the sheriff again, telling him what had happened. He arrived with a couple of deputies, their faces grim. We led them back to the clearing, but by the time we got there, the creature was gone. All that was left was a dark stain on the ground where it had bled. The sheriff looked at the stain, then at us. I believe you, he said. I don't know what that thing is, but it's dangerous. We need to close off this part of the park and warn people. The next few days were a blur of activity. The park was closed, and a team of experts was brought in to investigate. They found tracks, strange and unidentifiable, but no sign of the creature itself. The story made the local news, and people started calling it the Montana Mystery. Mark recovered from his injuries, but he decided to take a leave of absence. I couldn't blame him. I was shaken too, but I couldn't just walk away. This was my park, my home, and I needed to protect it. Months passed, and there were no more sightings of the creature. The park eventually reopened, but that part of the forest remained off-limits. The higher-ups deemed it a protected area, citing ecological concerns. The visitors were curious, of course, but we had our ways of keeping them out. Mark and I stayed in touch, though he never returned to his ranger duties. He moved to a quieter place, far from the memories of that night. We often joked about our encounter, trying to make light of it, but there was always an underlying tension, a shared understanding that what we'd faced was no laughing matter. One day, about a year after the incident, I was patrolling near the restricted area when I came across a group of teenagers trying to sneak in. They had that look of defiance mixed with curiosity the kind that makes you remember your own youth. Hey, you can't be here, I called out. They turned, startled, then tried to play it cool. Ah, uh, come on, man. We just want to see what's back there, one of them said, a tall kid with a cocky grin. I shook my head. Trust me, you don't. Now turn around and head back the way you came. It's not safe. They grumbled but eventually complied. As they walked away, I couldn't help but feel a pang of responsibility. The memory of that creature, its dark eyes and pale skin, was never far from my mind. Life went on, but I stayed vigilant. The park was my home, and I felt a duty to protect it, even from things that shouldn't exist. I kept my encounters with the creature mostly to myself sharing only the necessary details with those who needed to know. The fewer people who knew, the better. One night, 
As I was locking up the ranger station, I heard a noise outside. It was a soft, almost rhythmic tapping. I grabbed my flashlight and stepped out onto the porch, scanning the darkness. The tapping continued, drawing me towards the edge of the woods. Who's there? I called out, my voice steady despite the unease settling in my stomach. No answer. Just the tapping, growing louder. I moved closer, the beam of my flashlight cutting through the night. And then I saw it. Not the creature, but something else, something worse. It was a figure, hunched and ragged, its clothes tattered and covered in dirt. It turned towards me, and I saw its eyes, empty, soulless. It wasn't the same as the creature I'd encountered before, but it was no less terrifying. It was like looking into the face of something long dead, brought back to life. I backed up slowly, my heart pounding. Stay back, I warned, but the figure kept advancing. I fumbled for my radio, calling for backup. This is Vance. I need assistance at the East Station. Now. The figure lunged at me, and I swung my flashlight, connecting with its head. It staggered but didn't fall. I ran back into the station, slamming the door shut and bolting it. The figure pounded on the door, the wood creaking under the force. Minutes felt like hours until I heard the sound of sirens and saw the flashing lights of the park patrol. The pounding stopped, and when I opened the door, the figure was gone. Vanished, just like the creature from before. The deputies searched the area but found nothing. I gave my report, trying to make sense of what I'd seen. Sheriff Daniels was there, his face lined with concern. You think it's connected? he asked, his voice low. I nodded. I don't know how, but it feels the same. Like there's something out there, something we don't understand. He sighed, rubbing his temples. We'll keep looking, Curtis. But be careful. Whatever this is, it's not done yet. I spent the next few months on high alert patrolling the park with an intensity that bordered on obsession. I wasn't going to let anyone else get hurt. But no matter how vigilant I was, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. One evening, as the sun set over the mountains, I sat on the porch of the ranger station, sipping my coffee. It was quiet, peaceful even, but I knew better than to let my guard down. As I looked out over the park... I saw a figure in the distance, standing at the edge of the woods. It was too far to make out any details, but I knew it was watching me. I stood up, setting my coffee down. All right, let's see what you want, I muttered, heading towards the figure. But as I got closer, it disappeared into the trees. I followed, my flashlight cutting through the darkness. I reached the clearing where I'd first seen the creature, and there it was, standing in the same spot. It looked at me with those dark, unblinking eyes. I didn't feel fear this time, just a cold determination. What do you want? I demanded. It didn't answer, just stared. And then, in a swift motion, it turned and walked into the woods. I hesitated for a moment, then followed. The creature led me through the forest, moving quickly and silently. I struggled to keep up, my flashlight bouncing with each step. We reached a small cave, hidden by thick underbrush. The creature disappeared inside, and I hesitated. But I couldn't turn back now. I ducked into the cave, the darkness swallowing me. Inside... The air was damp and cold. My flashlight revealed walls covered in strange markings, symbols I didn't recognize. The creature stood in the center of the cave, watching me. Why are you here? I asked again, my voice echoing off the stone walls. It moved towards me, and I raised my flashlight, 
ready to defend myself. But it didn't attack. Instead, it held out its hand, revealing the locket I'd found a year ago. I took a step back, confused. What do you want me to do? The creature pointed to the markings on the wall, then to the locket. I stared at it, trying to make sense of the symbols. They looked like some kind of map, but to where, I couldn't tell. Suddenly, the cave shook, and the ground beneath me began to crumble. The creature backed away, its eyes fixed on me. I turned and ran, the cave collapsing behind me. I burst out into the night, breathing heavily. The creature was gone, and so was the locket. I stumbled back to the ranger station, my mind racing. What had I just seen? What did it all mean? The sheriff and his deputies arrived soon after, drawn by the noise. I told them what had happened, but without the locket or the creature, there was little they could do. Days turned into weeks, and the park returned to a semblance of normalcy. But I couldn't shake the feeling that it wasn't over. That whatever was out there was still watching, still waiting. I spent every free moment studying the markings I'd seen, trying to piece together the puzzle. I even reached out to experts in ancient symbols and folklore, but no one could give me a clear answer. One night, as I sat in my cabin, poring over my notes, I heard a knock at the door. I opened it to find an old man, his face lined with age and wisdom. He introduced himself as Professor Elias, an expert in ancient cultures. I hear you've been looking for answers, he said, his voice calm and measured. I invited him in, and he examined my notes, nodding thoughtfully. These symbols are old, very old. They tell a story of a creature that guards a hidden place, a place of great power. What kind of power? I asked, leaning forward. He shook his head. That I cannot say. But whatever it is, it's not meant for us. The creature is a guardian, not an enemy. It was trying to warn you. I sat back the weight of his words sinking in. So what do we do? He smiled faintly. We leave it alone. Some mysteries are not meant to be solved. I nodded, a sense of relief washing over me. For the first time in months, I felt a sense of peace. The creature wasn't my enemy, and the park was safe. At least for now. As the professor left, I stood on the porch looking out over the park. The sun was setting, casting a warm glow over the trees. I took a deep breath, feeling the tension slowly ebb away. I knew there were still mysteries out there, things I couldn't explain. But I also knew that I didn't have to face them alone. The park was my home, and I would protect it, whatever it took. And if the creature ever returned, I would be ready not with fear, but with understanding. Because some battles are not about fighting, but about knowing when to stand your ground and when to let go. Life in the park continued, with its quiet moments and its challenges. But I never forgot that night, or the lessons it taught me. We are all guardians, in our own way, of the places and people we hold dear. And sometimes... The greatest strength comes from knowing when to stand and when to walk away. So, that's my story. Not just of fear and mystery, but of learning and growth. And I hope, if you ever find yourself in the park, you'll remember to respect the secrets it holds, and the guardians that watch over them. My name is Gage Harlow, and this happened to me in April, 1992. I remember the day clear as yesterday because I was working a search and rescue mission in the deep woods of the Ozarks, Arkansas. It was one of those crisp spring days when you could still feel the chill of winter lingering in the air, 
and the sunlight filtering through the trees felt like a promise of warmer days. I'd been with the search and rescue team for about ten years by then, and I'd seen my share of oddities and tragedies. But nothing had ever prepared me for what went down that day. It started out like any other mission. A hiker named Jared Caldwell had gone missing the previous afternoon. His wife reported it after he didn't return from a solo trek. It wasn't unusual for folks to get lost in those dense woods, so we geared up and set out. I met up with my buddy, Dale McAllister, at the trailhead. Dale was a burly guy, the kind who could probably wrestle a bear if he had to. He had a wicked sense of humor, too. We shared a few jokes as we prepared our gear, trying to keep the mood light despite the seriousness of the situation. Think he just found himself a nice quiet spot to nap? Dale quipped, adjusting his backpack. Yeah, maybe he's just enjoying some peace and quiet away from the missus. I replied with a chuckle, though we both knew it wasn't likely. The Ozarks weren't a place to wander off trail without a plan. The first few hours of the search were uneventful. We followed the trail Jared had supposedly taken, calling his name and scanning the area for any signs of him. As the sun climbed higher, casting long shadows through the trees, I began to feel an unease that I couldn't shake. It was too quiet, even for the forest. We reached a fork in the trail where Jared might have gone off track. Dale and I split up, keeping in radio contact. I took the left path, which led deeper into the forest, the trees growing denser and the light dimmer. After about an hour of hiking, I stumbled upon something odd. It was a makeshift campsite, but not like any I'd seen before. The tent was there, but it was shredded, almost like something had torn through it with brute force. Scattered around were personal items, a backpack, a hat, a few cooking utensils, and blood. Not a lot, but enough to make my heart skip a beat. Dale, you there? I radioed in, trying to keep my voice steady. Yeah, what's up? He replied, a hint of static crackling through. I found something. Looks like he might have set up camp here, but it's a mess. There's blood. Stay put, I'm on my way. While I waited for Dale, I examined the area more closely. The blood trail wasn't large, but it led away from the campsite deeper into the woods. It was strange, though. It didn't look like a wild animal attack. Too calculated, almost. Like someone or something had known exactly what it was doing. Dale arrived his usually jovial face now serious. He took one look at the scene and muttered a curse under his breath. Damn, Gage. What the hell happened here? I don't know, but whatever it was, it wasn't pretty. We need to follow this trail. We moved cautiously, following the sparse drops of blood. The forest seemed to close in around us, the trees growing thicker, their branches intertwining like skeletal fingers. The further we went, the darker it got, until it felt like we were walking through twilight despite the mid-afternoon sun. After about thirty minutes, we stumbled upon a small clearing. At the center, there was a large rock, and on it, sprawled in a way that made my stomach churn, was Jared Caldwell, or what was left of him. His body was torn open, his eyes wide in a frozen expression of terror. It wasn't just the sight of him that was disturbing. It was the way he was positioned, almost like he'd been displayed. Dale turned away and vomited, the sound echoing in the eerie silence. We need to call this in, I said, my voice barely above a whisper. As I reached for my radio, I heard a rustling from the trees behind us. We both froze, exchanging a glance that said everything we were thinking. Slowly, we turned around, and that's when we saw it. I still don't know what it was. 
It wasn't human, that much was clear. It stood on two legs, but its body was twisted and grotesque, covered in patches of matted fur and scales. Its eyes glowed a sickly yellow, and it let out a sound that was somewhere between a hiss and a growl. It moved quickly, too quickly, darting behind trees, almost like it was toying with us. Run! I shouted, grabbing Dale's arm and pulling him along. We bolted back the way we came, the creature hot on our heels. The forest became a blur of green and brown as we ran, adrenaline pumping through our veins. I could hear it crashing through the underbrush behind us, getting closer with each passing second. We burst out onto the main trail, our breaths ragged. I looked back and saw nothing, but I knew it was still there, watching, waiting. We need to get out of here, Dale panted, his face pale. No kidding, I replied, my mind racing. Let's head back to the trailhead, radio this in, and get a team out here. We made our way back, every snap of a twig or rustle of leaves putting us on edge. When we finally reached the trailhead, we were met by the rest of the team. Their faces showed a mix of relief and confusion. What happened? Did you find him? One of them asked. We found him, all right, Dale said, shaking his head. But there's something out there. Something not human. We relayed what we'd seen, the mutilated body, the creature. The team leader, a grizzled veteran named Tom Avery, listened with a frown. Sounds like you boys let your imaginations get the better of you, he said, though there was a flicker of doubt in his eyes. Tom, we know what we saw, I insisted. You need to send a team out there, armed. This thing is dangerous, Tom sighed, rubbing his temples. All right, we'll take a look. But I don't want to hear any more of this monster nonsense. Let's keep our heads straight. A new team was assembled, and this time, they were armed. Dale and I were ordered to stay behind and debrief, which suited us just fine. We were in no hurry to go back into those woods. Hours passed with no word. As night fell, the team finally returned, but they didn't find Jared's body, nor any sign of the creature. Just the remnants of the campsite and the blood trail. Tom pulled me aside. Are you sure about what you saw? Positive, I said. There's something out there, Tom. Something that's not an animal or a human. He nodded slowly. We'll keep this under wraps for now. No need to panic the locals. But keep your eyes open. If you see anything else, report it immediately. Weeks went by without incident, but the memory of that day haunted me. I couldn't shake the image of Jared's body, or the feeling of being hunted by that creature. Dale and I kept in touch, sharing uneasy jokes about Bigfoot and forest demons, but the humor was forced. Then, about a month later, another hiker went missing. This time, a young woman named Emily Parker. The search was more intense, with more people involved, but the results were the same. Her body was found mutilated in a similar manner, displayed on a rock deep in the woods. Panic began to spread through the community. Rumors of a wild animal attack were circulated to keep people calm, but those of us who knew the truth were on edge. More patrols were sent out, but the creature remained elusive, almost like it knew how to avoid detection. One night, I was sitting at home, nursing a beer and trying to unwind, when my phone rang. It was Dale. Gage, you need to come over. Now. There was an urgency in his voice that sent a chill down my spine. I grabbed my keys and drove to his place, my mind racing with possibilities. When I arrived, Dale was pale and sweating. He led me to his living room, where he had laid out a series of maps and notes. I've been doing some digging, 
he said, his voice shaky. There have been similar disappearances reported in other parts of the country. Always in remote, heavily wooded areas. Always the same M.O. I looked at the maps, the dots marking locations from Oregon to Maine. So what are you saying? This thing's been traveling around killing people? Maybe, Dale replied. Or maybe there's more than one of them. The idea was terrifying, but it made a sick sort of sense. Whatever this creature was, it wasn't confined to our little corner of the world. We decided to take our findings to Tom. He was skeptical, as always, but the mounting evidence was hard to ignore. A task force was formed, combining local law enforcement and wildlife experts to try and track down the creature or creatures. The searches continued, but the woods remained silent. The creature seemed to have vanished as quickly as it had appeared. The official story remained that of animal attacks, though whispers of something more sinister persisted among the search and rescue team. I eventually moved away from the Ozarks, the memories of those hunts too heavy to bear. I took a desk job in a quieter town, far from any deep woods. Dale stayed behind, always the stubborn one, determined to uncover the truth. To this day, I don't know what we encountered out there. Some nights, when the world is quiet and the shadows long, I think about Jared and Emily, and all the others who might have fallen prey to whatever lurks in those forests. And I wonder if, somewhere out there, it's still watching, waiting for its next victim. My name is Norman Quinn, and this happened to me on July 7, 1993. I've been a truck driver for over 20 years, crisscrossing the United States, hauling everything from livestock to electronics. This job suits me well. I like the open road, the solitude, and the sense of freedom. But one night in the backcountry of Nevada changed everything. I was on my way to deliver a load of furniture to a warehouse in Carson City. The route I took was off the beaten path, winding through desolate stretches of desert. The sky was a deep, inky black, scattered with stars, and the air was dry and warm. My truck's headlights cut through the darkness, illuminating the empty road ahead. I had the radio on, some old rock tunes keeping me company. I remember thinking about my daughter, Jenny. She had just turned sixteen and was bugging me to teach her how to drive. I promised her I'd take her out on the weekend once I got back. That thought brought a smile to my face. It's funny how life can take a turn when you least expect it. Around midnight I noticed my fuel gauge was lower than I'd anticipated. I needed to find a gas station soon. About twenty minutes later, a small, dimly lit sign indicated a gas station a mile ahead. It wasn't one of those big chain stations, just a single pump outside a rundown convenience store. But it would do. I pulled in and stepped out of the cab. The place was eerily quiet, and the only sound was the hum of the pump as I filled the tank. I walked into the store to pay. The guy behind the counter looked like he hadn't seen a customer in hours. He was a scrawny fellow, with sunken eyes and a cigarette dangling from his lips. He barely acknowledged me as I handed him some cash. As I walked back to my truck, I noticed something strange. A dark sedan was parked a little ways off, partially hidden in the shadows. There was no one in it but something about it didn't sit right with me. I shrugged it off and climbed back into my rig, ready to get back on the road. A few miles down the highway, I noticed headlights in my rearview mirror. The same dark sedan was tailing me, keeping a steady distance. At first, I thought it was just a coincidence. 
But as the miles rolled by, it stayed with me. My unease grew. Maybe I was being paranoid, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. I decided to pull over at a rest stop to see if they'd follow. As I eased my truck into the parking lot, the sedan kept driving, disappearing into the night. I let out a sigh of relief. Maybe it was just my imagination after all. The rest stop was deserted. I stepped out to stretch my legs, the cool night air a welcome change from the stuffy cab. I leaned against the hood, taking in the quiet. But then I heard it, a rustling noise coming from the bushes behind the restrooms. My heart skipped a beat. I wasn't armed, never saw the need for it, but now I wished I had something more than just a pocket knife. I turned to head back to my truck when I saw him. A man stepped out from the shadows, dressed in dark clothing. He didn't say a word, just stood there, staring at me. His eyes were cold, devoid of any emotion. Instinct kicked in, and I made a beeline for the cab. But he was fast, too fast. He tackled me to the ground, and I felt a sharp pain in my side. He'd stabbed me. The pain was intense, but adrenaline kept me going. I kicked and thrashed, trying to break free. He didn't say a word, just kept attacking with a frightening determination. Somehow, I managed to get my hands on a rock and smashed it against his head. He grunted and fell back, giving me enough time to scramble to my feet and get to the truck. I slammed the door shut and locked it, blood pouring from my side. The man got up, blood trickling down his face, and walked slowly towards the truck. He pulled out a handgun, pointing it at me through the window. I floored the gas pedal, tires screeching as I sped out of the rest stop. My mind raced as fast as the truck. I needed help, and fast. The nearest town was still miles away, and I was losing blood. I grabbed my CB radio, calling for help. My voice was shaky, but clear enough to convey the urgency. This is Norman Quinn. I've been attacked at a rest stop near mile marker 112 on Highway 50. I'm bleeding pretty bad. Anyone out there? Silence. Then, a crackle and a response. Norman, this is Pete. I'm about ten miles ahead of you. Hang in there, buddy. I'm calling the cops and an ambulance. Keep driving. Hearing Pete's voice was a relief. I kept one hand pressed against my wound, trying to slow the bleeding, while the other gripped the wheel. The road seemed endless, each minute feeling like an hour. Then I saw it. A police cruiser, lights flashing, coming up behind me. I slowed down and pulled over. Two officers rushed to my door. One of them, a tall, stocky guy named Officer Davis, helped me out and into the back seat of the cruiser. The other officer, a younger woman named Officer Riley, went to inspect my truck. An ambulance is on its way, Norman. Hang in there. Davis said, pressing a cloth against my wound. I nodded, trying to stay conscious. My vision blurred, but I could make out the outline of another vehicle approaching. It was Pete's truck. He pulled over and ran to me, his face etched with concern. Jesus, Norm, what happened? He asked, looking at the blood-soaked cloth. Some guy attacked me at the rest stop. I managed to say. He's got a gun. Officer Riley came back, her face grim. There's no sign of anyone else, but we found blood on the ground. We need to get him to the hospital now. The next few hours were a blur. I remember the ambulance ride, the bright lights of the hospital, and the concerned faces of the doctors and nurses. They patched me up, stitched the wound, and pumped me full of painkillers. I drifted in and out of consciousness, the events of the night replaying in my mind. 
When I finally woke up, it was morning. Pete was sitting by my bedside, looking exhausted. Hey, you're awake, he said, forcing a smile. Did they catch him? I asked, my voice hoarse. Pete shook his head. Not yet. But they're looking. You're lucky to be alive, Norm. That guy meant business. I nodded, feeling a wave of exhaustion wash over me. The reality of what happened was starting to sink in. I could have died out there. If it weren't for Pete and those officers, I might not have made it. A few days later, I was discharged from the hospital. The cops still hadn't found the guy who attacked me. They said it was likely he was a drifter, someone who moved from place to place, never staying long enough to get caught. That didn't make me feel any better. I went back to work after a few weeks, but things weren't the same. Every time I pulled into a rest stop or a gas station, I felt a knot of fear in my stomach. I couldn't shake the memory of that night. Jenny noticed the change in me, too. She asked me once why I seemed so distant. I told her I was just tired, but the truth was, I didn't want to worry her. Months passed, and life slowly returned to a semblance of normalcy. But I was always on edge, always looking over my shoulder. The world didn't feel as safe as it once did. That dark sedan haunted my dreams, and the face of my attacker was etched in my memory. One evening, while sitting at a truck stop diner with Pete, I opened up to him about my fears. I keep thinking he's out there, you know? Watching, waiting for another chance. Pete took a sip of his coffee, then looked me in the eye. Norm, you can't let this guy control your life. Yeah, it's scary, and it's messed up what happened. But you survived. You fought back. That counts for something. I nodded, appreciating his words, but it wasn't that simple. Trusting the road again was a challenge. Every unfamiliar car, every strange face, set me on edge. I kept a baseball bat under my seat now, a small comfort but better than nothing. One night, about a year after the attack, I was driving through Texas, on my way to Houston. The road was empty the sky clear. I felt a sense of calm I hadn't felt in a long time. Maybe it was the vastness of the landscape or the familiarity of the route. Whatever it was, it felt good. Then, in my rearview mirror, I saw it. Headlights keeping pace with me. My heart raced, and my palms went sweaty. I gripped the wheel tighter my mind flashing back to that night in Nevada. But this time, I was ready. I kept driving, watching the car closely. It stayed with me for miles, and my anxiety grew with each passing minute. Finally, I decided to confront it. I pulled over to the side of the road, grabbing the baseball bat from under my seat. The car slowed down, then stopped a few feet behind me. I stepped out, the bat in hand, ready for whatever came next. The driver's door opened, and a man stepped out. He was middle-aged, with a weary look on his face. He raised his hands in a gesture of peace. Whoa, whoa, take it easy, buddy. I'm just looking for directions. I lowered the bat slightly, but my guard was still up. Directions? At this hour? He nodded. Yeah, I got lost a few miles back. My GPS isn't working right, and I've been trying to find my way to the nearest town. I studied him for a moment, then nodded. All right. Head straight for about ten miles, and you'll hit a small town. There should be signs for it. Thanks, he said, relief evident in his voice. He got back into his car and drove off, leaving me standing there, the bat still in my hand. I let out a shaky breath, realizing how close I'd come to losing it. As I got back into my truck, 
I knew things would never be the same. The road wasn't just a place of freedom anymore. It held dangers I couldn't ignore. But I also knew I couldn't let fear control my life. I had to keep moving forward, one mile at a time. The man who attacked me was never caught, and maybe he never would be. But I'd learned to be more cautious, more aware of my surroundings. And I'd learned to appreciate the little things, like teaching Jenny how to drive, or sharing a laugh with Pete over a cup of coffee. Life goes on, and so do I. That's my story. It's not a happy one, but it's mine. And it's real. My name is Arlen Sutter, and this happened to me on October 15, 2012. I was never much of an outdoorsman, but my buddy, Davis Hawkins, was always trying to get me out of the city. Just one weekend, Arlen, he'd say. It'll do you good. So, I finally caved in and bought myself a used RV. Davis and I planned a camping trip to the Ozarks a place he swore by for its serenity and beauty. We arrived late on a Friday, the sun already dipping below the horizon. The spot was isolated, with thick trees hemming us in on all sides. There was a small clearing where we parked the RV, and Davis got to work setting up a fire while I unpacked. The first night was uneventful, filled with beer and stories about our college days. Saturday morning, Davis wanted to hike to a nearby stream he'd found on a previous trip. I was hesitant, preferring the comfort of the RV, but he convinced me. It's just a short hike, he promised. We set off, the crisp autumn air invigorating. The forest was alive with the sounds of birds and rustling leaves. It was almost peaceful. We reached the stream by noon and spent a couple of hours fishing. Davis caught a couple of small trout, and I managed to tangle my line more than once. We started back in the early afternoon, the sun casting long shadows through the trees. On our way back, we came across an old, dilapidated cabin. It looked abandoned, but curiosity got the better of us. Davis wanted to check it out and I, against my better judgment, followed him inside. The place was a wreck, with broken furniture and dust covering everything. In one corner, there was a pile of old newspapers and a rusted metal box. Davis pried it open, revealing a bunch of old photographs and a strange-looking amulet. This is some creepy stuff, I said, trying to hide my unease. Davis just laughed pocketing the amulet. Relax, Arlen. It's just junk. We left the cabin and made our way back to the RV. That night, things started to get weird. We were sitting by the fire, and Davis was fiddling with the amulet, turning it over in his hands. The firelight cast strange shadows, and for a moment, it looked like the amulet was glowing. Do you see that? I asked, pointing at it. Davis shook his head. Nah, you're seeing things. I didn't sleep well that night. Every little noise outside had me on edge. I kept thinking about that cabin and the weird vibe it gave off. At some point, I must have dozed off, because I woke up to Davis shaking me. Arlen, wake up. Do you hear that? I listened. There was a low, steady hum coming from somewhere outside. What the hell is that? I muttered, rubbing my eyes. Davis looked as freaked out as I felt. We grabbed our flashlights and stepped outside, the cold night air hitting us like a slap. The hum was louder now, and it seemed to be coming from the direction of the cabin. We should check it out, Davis said, his voice wavering. I wanted to tell him no, to pack up and leave, but something about the look in his eyes stopped me. 
We made our way through the forest, the beam of our flashlights cutting through the darkness. The hum grew louder with each step, vibrating in my chest. When we reached the cabin, the door was ajar. The hum was almost deafening now, coming from inside. We stepped in, and the amulet Davis had left on the floor was glowing, pulsing with a strange, eerie light. What the hell is that thing? I asked, but Davis didn't answer. He was staring at the amulet, his face pale. Then something happened. The hum stopped, and for a moment there was complete silence. And then, a sound like ripping fabric, followed by a crash. Davis screamed, a sound I'll never forget, and he was gone. One moment he was standing next to me, and the next he was just gone. I ran out of the cabin, my heart pounding in my chest. I didn't stop until I reached the RV. I fumbled with the keys, my hands shaking. I locked myself inside and sat there, trying to make sense of what had just happened. I didn't sleep at all that night. The next morning, I called the local authorities, but when they arrived, there was no sign of Davis or the cabin. The spot where it stood was just an empty clearing. They didn't believe me, thought I was drunk or hallucinating. They searched the area but found nothing. I drove back to the city in a daze. I tried to explain what had happened to Davis's family, but they looked at me like I was crazy. The official report listed Davis as missing, presumed dead. I couldn't shake the feeling that the amulet had something to do with it, but without any evidence, it was just my word against reality. Years passed, and the memory of that night still haunts me. I've tried to move on, but every now and then, I hear that hum in the back of my mind. Sometimes, I think about going back, trying to find the cabin again, but fear always stops me. I've read up on local folklore, trying to find any mention of an amulet or a cabin that matches what I saw. One name keeps coming up in old stories, a creature called Merc. It's said to be a guardian of some kind, a protector of ancient relics. I can't be sure, but it's the only thing that makes any sense. I still have the RV, but I haven't gone camping since. I stick to the city now, where the noise of traffic drowns out the hum. But late at night, when everything is quiet, I sometimes hear it. And I remember Davis's scream and the look on his face. I've accepted that I'll never have all the answers. Some things are just beyond understanding. But I know what I experienced, and I'll carry that with me for the rest of my life. Davis was my friend, and I wish I could have done something to save him. But whatever that thing was, it took him, and I'm not sure if it can be stopped. In the end, all I can do is tell the story and hope that someone out there believes me. Maybe they'll be smarter than we were more cautious. And maybe, just maybe, they'll find a way to stop Merc before it takes someone else. My name is Deacon Huntley. I work for a covert unit of the U.S. government that deals with cryptids, creatures that science hasn't recognized. It's a job that isn't listed anywhere, and the people who know about us keep their mouths shut. My team and I were dispatched to the Pacific Northwest, a remote area near Mount Rainier, following a series of strange disappearances. Joining me were Clive Caldwell, a tracker with years of experience in the wild, and Dr. Emily Richards, a biologist who specialized in unknown species. We had received a tip from a local ranger about mutilated bodies found deep in the forest, far from any hiking trails. Our mission was simple, identify the threat and neutralize it, if possible. We set out early in the morning, the air crisp with the scent of pine and damp earth. Clive, 
always the Joker, remarked on the beauty of the surroundings. If we weren't here to track down a man-eating beast, this would be a great vacation spot, he said with a grin. Emily rolled her eyes, but I could see a hint of a smile on her lips. The ranger, Dan Whitmore, met us at the trailhead. He was a grizzled man in his fifties, with the look of someone who had seen more than he cared to remember. Glad you folks could make it, he said, shaking our hands. I've been here twenty years, and I've never seen anything like this. We followed Dan deep into the forest. The trail was barely visible, overgrown with ferns and moss. As we walked, he filled us in on the details. Two hikers found the first body about a month ago. Since then, we've had three more disappearances. The bodies, they weren't pretty. He led us to a small clearing, the site of the latest discovery. The air was heavy with the metallic scent of blood. Emily and I exchanged glances. We were both accustomed to grisly scenes, but this felt different. More violent. Clive examined the ground, noting the disturbed earth and broken branches. Whatever did this is big and strong, he muttered. No signs of a struggle, which means it took them by surprise. Emily crouched beside the remains, her face a mask of professionalism. These lacerations are deep, she observed. Almost like claws, but much larger than any animal I've studied. We decided to set up camp nearby, wanting to stay close to the scene in case the creature returned. As night fell, we gathered around a small fire, the flickering flames casting eerie shadows on the trees. Dan had left us to return to his post, promising to check in the next morning. The forest at night was a different world. The usual sounds of wildlife were absent, replaced by an oppressive silence. It was as if the forest itself was holding its breath. Clive and I took turns on watch, rifles ready, but the night passed without incident. The next day, we ventured further into the forest, following the faint traces left by the creature. Clive led the way, his keen eyes scanning the ground for any signs. Emily collected samples of fur and blood we found along the trail, hoping to analyze them later. As we moved deeper into the wilderness, the feeling of being watched grew stronger. It wasn't paranoia. It was an instinct honed from years of tracking dangerous prey. We knew we were in the creature's territory now. By late afternoon, we reached a series of caves nestled in a rocky outcrop. The air was cooler here, and the shadows seemed darker. Clive suggested we split up to cover more ground. I paired with Emily, while Clive took the other side. Emily and I entered the largest cave, our flashlights cutting through the gloom. The walls were damp, and the floor was littered with bones, animal and human. Emily paused to examine a particularly large femur, her expression grim. This thing is feeding on anything it can catch, she said quietly. Suddenly a scream echoed from the other side of the cave system. It was Clive. We ran towards the sound, adrenaline pumping through our veins. We found him near the entrance of a smaller cave, clutching his leg. Blood seeped through his fingers. Clive, what happened? I asked, kneeling beside him. Something, it attacked me, he gasped. Came out of nowhere. Fast, too fast. Emily quickly bandaged his wound while I scanned the surroundings, my rifle ready. The creature was close, and it was hunting us. We decided to move back to camp, helping Clive as best we could. The return journey was tense, every rustle in the underbrush setting our nerves on edge. We made it back to camp just as darkness fell. Clive's injury was worse than we initially thought. He was losing a lot of blood. Emily did her best to stabilize him, but we needed to get him to a hospital. 
I tried the radio, but the signal was weak. We're too far out, I said. We need to get to higher ground for a better signal. Emily stayed with Clive while I climbed a nearby hill. The view from the top was breathtaking, but I had no time to appreciate it. I managed to get a weak signal and called for an extraction team. They promised to be there by morning. As I made my way back to camp, the oppressive silence returned. I felt the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. I was being watched. I quickened my pace, my heart pounding. Suddenly, a shadow darted across my path. I raised my rifle, but it was gone. Back at camp, I found Emily tending to Clive. He was unconscious but stable. We're getting out of here in the morning, I said. We just need to hold out until then. We took turns on watch again, but this time the forest was alive with sounds, twigs snapping, leaves rustling. The creature was close, circling us. I felt a mix of dread and determination. Whatever this thing was, it wasn't going to take us without a fight. In the early hours of the morning, just as the first light began to creep into the sky, the creature made its move. It was a blur of motion, slamming into our camp with terrifying force. I fired a shot, but it was too fast. Emily screamed as it grabbed her, dragging her into the darkness. I chased after them, my flashlight beam bouncing wildly. The creature was enormous, its eyes glowing in the dim light. I fired again, hitting it in the shoulder. It roared, a sound that shook me to my core, and dropped Emily. She scrambled to her feet, and we ran back to camp. Clive was awake, his face pale. What the hell was that? he asked, his voice weak. I don't know, I replied, helping him up. But it's not getting another chance. We huddled together, weapons ready, waiting for the next attack. But the creature didn't come. Instead, we heard the distant thump of helicopter blades. The extraction team was here. Relief washed over us as the helicopter landed in the clearing. We helped Clive aboard, and Emily and I followed keeping our eyes on the forest. As we lifted off, I caught a glimpse of the creature standing at the edge of the trees, watching us. It was a hulking figure, covered in matted fur, with eyes that seemed almost human. We made it back to the base, and Clive was rushed to the infirmary. Emily and I were debriefed, our superiors demanding every detail. They promised to send another team to investigate, but I knew they wouldn't find anything. The creature was too smart, too elusive. In the weeks that followed, I couldn't shake the feeling that we had only scratched the surface. The disappearances in the area stopped, but the memory of those glowing eyes haunted my dreams. I couldn't help but wonder what else was out there, lurking in the shadows of our world. Clive recovered, but he decided to leave the unit. Emily and I continued our work, driven by the knowledge that there were more creatures out there, more mysteries to uncover. We had faced one of them and lived to tell the tale, but the hunt was far from over. The Pacific Northwest remained a place of secrets, its dense forests hiding more than just wildlife. And as long as there were creatures like the one we encountered— we would be there, ready to face whatever nightmares lurked in the darkness. My name is Rourke Calhoun, a carpenter by trade, living in the quiet, unassuming town of Oakwood Hills, Pennsylvania. Oakwood Hills is the kind of place where everyone knows each other, tucked away in the Allegheny Mountains, a place where the air smells of pine and the river runs clear. On weekends I would often explore the dense woods surrounding the town, drawn by the solitude and the whispers of the forest. 
It was during one of these excursions that my life took a turn I could never have imagined. The day started like any other, with the sun filtering through the leaves, casting dappled shadows on the forest floor. I had decided to venture deeper into the woods, to a place called Bitter Ridge. It was an area avoided by most, known for its rocky terrain and steep cliffs, but I felt the need for a challenge. I left early in the morning, my backpack filled with the essentials, water, snacks, a map, and a sturdy knife. The trail was overgrown, and I had to hack my way through in places, but I enjoyed the work. The further I went, the quieter it became, the only sounds being the rustling of leaves and the occasional call of a bird. Around midday, I came across an old cabin, one I hadn't seen on any of my previous hikes. It was weathered and looked abandoned, the windows boarded up, the door slightly ajar. Curiosity got the better of me, and I decided to take a look inside. The interior was dark and musty, with old furniture covered in a thick layer of dust. There was something unsettling about the place, a feeling I couldn't quite shake. As I moved through the rooms, I noticed strange markings on the walls, symbols carved into the wood that I didn't recognize. They looked ancient, and the sight of them sent a shiver down my spine. I left the cabin and continued my hike, but the sense of unease lingered. The forest seemed different, the shadows deeper, the silence heavier. I tried to shake it off, attributing it to the eerie discovery of the cabin, but the feeling persisted. As the sun began to set, I realized I had lost track of time. I decided to head back, not wanting to be caught in the woods after dark. That's when I heard it, a rustling in the bushes behind me. I turned, expecting to see a deer or a fox, but there was nothing. Just the trees and the shadows. I picked up my pace, the feeling of being watched growing stronger with each step. The rustling came again, closer this time, and I broke into a run. I could hear my own breath, my heart pounding in my chest. The forest seemed to close in around me, the trees forming a maze that I couldn't navigate. I stumbled and fell, the contents of my backpack spilling onto the ground. As I scrambled to gather my things, I saw something moving in the corner of my eye, a dark shape too fast to make out. I didn't wait to see what it was. I got up and ran, not stopping until I reached the edge of the forest and the safety of the town. Back in Oakwood Hills, I tried to tell myself it was just my imagination, that the isolation of the woods had played tricks on my mind. But I couldn't shake the feeling that something had followed me back. That night, I had trouble sleeping. I kept hearing noises outside my window, the same rustling I had heard in the forest. I got up to check, but there was nothing there. Just the darkness and the silence. The next day, I met up with my friend, Henry Lawson, a retired police officer who had lived in Oakwood Hills his whole life. I told him about the cabin and the strange markings, and he listened with a furrowed brow. Rourke, I've heard stories about Bitter Ridge, he said. Old tales about disappearances and strange sightings. Most folks around here avoid that place. Do you think there's something to it? I asked. I don't know, he replied. But it's best to be careful. Stay away from there for a while. I took his advice and tried to put the experience behind me but it wasn't long before the unease returned. People in town started to go missing. First, it was a young couple who had gone hiking and never came back. Then, an old man who lived on the outskirts of town. Search parties were organized, but no trace of them was ever found. One evening, Henry came to my house, looking more serious than I had ever seen him. "'Rourke, we need to talk.' he said. 
I think whatever is happening might be connected to that cabin you found. We sat down, and he told me about an old case he had worked on years ago. A similar series of disappearances had occurred, and the investigation had led him to Bitter Ridge. He had found the same markings, but the case had gone cold, and the disappearances had stopped, until now. We need to go back there, he said. We need to find out what's going on. I wasn't thrilled about the idea, but I knew he was right. We gathered our gear and headed into the forest, retracing my steps to the cabin. It was dusk by the time we arrived, the shadows long and the air thick with tension. The cabin looked the same as before, but something felt different. As we approached, we saw fresh footprints leading inside. Henry drew his gun, and I followed him, knife in hand. The interior was just as dark and musty, but the markings seemed to glow faintly in the dim light. We moved cautiously through the rooms, our footsteps echoing in the silence. Then we heard it, a low, guttural sound, coming from the back of the cabin. We followed the noise, hearts pounding, and found a hidden door leading to a basement. The basement was cold and damp, the air thick with the smell of decay. In the center of the room was a large stone altar, covered in the same strange symbols. And there, on the floor, was the missing couple, lifeless and pale. Before we could react, the door slammed shut behind us, and we were plunged into darkness. Henry fumbled for his flashlight, but it was knocked out of his hand by something unseen. I felt a sharp pain in my side and fell to the ground, struggling to stay conscious. In the dim light, I saw a shape, large and humanoid, but not quite. It moved with an unnatural speed, attacking Henry before he could fire his gun. He fought back, but it was no use. The creature was too strong, too fast. I watched in horror as it tore into him the sound of his screams filling the room. I managed to crawl to the altar and grabbed a piece of broken stone. With all my remaining strength, I hurled it at the creature, hitting it in the head. It staggered back, giving me enough time to get to my feet and find the flashlight. I shone the light on the creature, and for a moment, I saw it clearly. It was a grotesque, twisted figure, more animal than human, with eyes that glowed in the dark. It recoiled from the light, giving me a chance to grab Henry and drag him towards the stairs. We stumbled out of the cabin and into the forest, the creature's roars echoing behind us. We didn't stop running until we reached the edge of the woods, collapsing on the ground, gasping for breath. Henry was badly injured but alive. We made it back to town and went straight to the sheriff's office. They organized another search party, but the cabin was gone when they returned to Bitter Ridge. There was no trace of the creature or the bodies we had found. The disappearances stopped after that, but the town was never the same. People moved away, and those who stayed spoke in hushed tones about the horrors of the forest. Henry and I never talked about what we saw, but the memory haunted us both. Years have passed since that night, and Oakwood Hills is a ghost town now, abandoned and forgotten. But I can't forget. The forest still calls to me, and sometimes, late at night, I hear the rustling of the leaves and the whispers of the trees, reminding me of the darkness that lurks within. My name is Terence Wakefield. I've worked in a cryptid hunting unit for the U.S. government for over a decade. Our team is tasked with tracking and capturing creatures that most people don't even believe exist. My friends and family think I work in wildlife management, which isn't far from the truth, but they wouldn't believe the kinds of wildlife we deal with. 
It was autumn, and the leaves were turning gold and red in the Allegheny Mountains of Pennsylvania. The air was crisp, the kind of crisp that makes your breath visible and your cheeks sting. Our team had been stationed in this region for a few weeks following reports of mysterious disappearances and sightings of strange creatures. I've been skeptical most of my life, but I've seen things in this job that would turn any man into a believer. I was with my partner, Rick Hargrove, a burly man with a no-nonsense attitude. We'd been through thick and thin together, and he was the only one I trusted completely in the field. We were preparing for a night patrol. The locals were whispering about a creature with glowing eyes, seen at dusk, and we needed to investigate. We're heading out. Rick called out to our team leader, Will. Let's make this quick. I don't want to miss the game tonight. Rick's attempt at humor was his way of easing the tension. We both knew that missing persons in these parts rarely ended well. We set out at sunset, the sky a mix of purples and oranges. The forest was dense, the kind that swallows sound and light. We walked in silence, ears tuned to the slightest rustle. An hour in, we found the remains of a campsite, abandoned. It looked like it had been ransacked. There was blood on the leaves, but no sign of bodies. Looks fresh. Rick said, kneeling to examine the ground. Could be from today. We pressed on, following a faint trail of blood. As we moved deeper into the woods, the sun dipped below the horizon, and darkness enveloped us. Our flashlights cut through the black, revealing shadows that played tricks on the eyes. Every crack of a branch, every rustle of leaves set my nerves on edge. Suddenly, we heard a scream, human and agonizing. It came from the north, not far from where we stood. We sprinted towards the sound, hearts pounding. We broke through the trees into a small clearing and saw a man, or what was left of him. His body was torn, limbs askew, eyes wide open in terror. Jesus, Rick whispered. What could have done this? Before I could respond, we heard a low, guttural sound behind us. We turned, flashlights searching, and saw it. A creature, unlike anything I'd ever seen. It stood on two legs, covered in matted fur, eyes glowing in eerie yellow. It had long, sharp claws and a snout like a wolf's. It didn't look like anything from any book or report I'd read. I reached for my gun but Rick already had his out. He fired, the shots echoing through the forest. The creature snarled and lunged at Rick, its claws slashing through the air. Rick screamed, going down under the weight of the beast. I fired at the creature, hitting it in the shoulder. It howled, a sound that made my blood run cold, and turned towards me. Rick was on the ground, bleeding badly. I didn't have time to think. I fired again and again, but the creature seemed unfazed. It swiped at me, and I felt a searing pain in my side as its claws raked across my flesh. I stumbled back, my vision blurring. The creature loomed over me, ready to strike. Then, from the trees, came more gunfire. Will and the rest of the team had arrived. The creature roared and retreated into the darkness, leaving us with our wounds and the dead man in the clearing. We called for medical evacuation. Rick was barely conscious, blood pouring from his wounds. I pressed my hand against my side, trying to staunch the bleeding. It felt like hours before help arrived, though it was probably only minutes. They airlifted us to the nearest hospital. Rick was in critical condition. I had several deep gashes but would live. The doctors were baffled by the nature of our injuries, but we had a cover story prepared, an attack by a rogue bear. Weeks passed. Rick didn't make it. He succumbed to his injuries, and I felt a part of me die with him. 
He was more than a partner. He was a brother. I attended his funeral, standing among his family, who didn't know the truth of what took him. Back at headquarters, the team reviewed the mission. We couldn't find the creature again. It had vanished, like smoke in the wind. The official report listed it as an unknown predator, but we knew better. We called it the Beast of Allegheny. In our files, a nameless terror that now haunted my dreams. Months turned into years. The incident faded from public memory, replaced by other news. But for me, it was always there, lurking in the back of my mind. I still work for the unit, though I'm more cautious now. I carry Rick's dog tags with me on every mission, a reminder of the cost of our work. I never return to the Alleghenies. Some places are best left undisturbed. But I couldn't shake the feeling that the beast was still out there, waiting. The government covered up the incident, as they always do, and life went on. People continued to go missing in those woods, and whispers of glowing eyes persisted. The locals had their stories, but no one believed them, just as no one would believe mine. I live with the scars, both seen and unseen, and a gnawing fear that one day I might cross paths with that creature again. Rick's family never knew the truth, and maybe that was for the best. They mourned him as a hero, a victim of circumstance. I carried the weight of that night, the guilt of survival. Some nights, I wake in a cold sweat, the image of that beast seared into my mind. Life goes on, they say. But for some of us, it goes on with shadows that never quite disappear, with nightmares that are all too real. We do our duty, face the unknown, and hope that the next mission won't be our last. The Beast of Allegheny remains a mystery a reminder that there are things in this world that defy understanding. We hunt the cryptids, but sometimes it feels like they're hunting us. And in those quiet moments before sleep, I can almost hear the echoes of that night, the screams, the roars, and the silence that followed. Terence Wakefield, cryptid hunter, survivor, bearer of a secret too dark to share. This is my story, one of many in a world where the line between myth and reality blurs, and where the monsters are all too real. My name is Quincy Thorne, and I guess you could say my life used to be pretty ordinary. Grew up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, went to college in Madison, and now I'm a graphic designer. You know, the usual stuff. But last year, something happened to me that changed everything. I still don't really understand it, and maybe I never will. Here's what went down. I had just turned 31 and decided it was high time for a road trip. I convinced my buddy Caleb, who I'd known since freshman year, to take a week off work and join me. Caleb was always game for an adventure, and we figured we'd head south, explore some small towns along the Mississippi River. We weren't looking for anything fancy, just a chance to get away from the city, have a few beers, and take in some new scenery. We set off on a Tuesday morning, my old Subaru packed with snacks, a cooler full of beer, and a tent just in case we felt like roughing it. The first couple of days were great. We stopped in La Crosse, wandered around the bluffs, and had a fantastic time in a tiny bar where the bartender, an old guy named Gus, told us ghost stories about the river. It was exactly what we needed. On Friday, we decided to head further south to a town called Bonjul. Neither of us had ever heard of it, but it sounded quaint. The drive was easy mostly back roads through endless fields and patches of forest. By the time we arrived, it was late afternoon, and the town looked like something out of a Norman Rockwell painting, charming little houses, 
a main street with a diner and a few local shops. We checked into a small bed and breakfast run by a sweet lady named Mrs. Talbot. She was probably in her seventies, with white hair tied up in a bun and a smile that made you feel right at home. She told us about a local festival happening that evening at the town square, a perfect opportunity to meet some locals and enjoy the small town charm. The festival was delightful, all the usual stuff, food stalls, live music, kids running around with painted faces. Caleb and I grabbed a couple of beers and found a spot near the stage where a local band was playing covers of old rock songs. We chatted with some folks, laughed, and for a while, everything felt perfect. It was around nine when I first noticed something odd. A guy, probably in his late forties, kept glancing our way. He was tall, with a scruffy beard and piercing blue eyes, wearing an old leather jacket despite the warm evening. At first, I thought he was just curious about the newcomers, but his stare felt too intense. I nudged Caleb and pointed him out. Creepy, right? I said. Caleb shrugged. Maybe he's just drunk. Small towns, you know. We laughed it off and continued enjoying the music. But the guy didn't leave. Every time I glanced his way, he was still watching us. After a while, I started to feel genuinely uneasy. Let's head back, I suggested. Caleb agreed, and we made our way through the crowd, back to the bed and breakfast. As we walked, I kept looking over my shoulder. The guy wasn't following us, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. We reached Mrs. Talbot's place without incident, and I tried to put the stranger out of my mind. We watched some TV, had a couple more beers, and called it a night. I woke up around 3 a.m., my throat parched. I quietly got out of bed, careful not to wake Caleb, and made my way to the kitchen for a glass of water. As I passed the front window, I froze. There, standing across the street, was the man from the festival. Just standing, staring at the house. My heart started pounding. I moved away from the window, trying to stay calm. Maybe he was just passing by. Maybe I was overreacting. But then I heard a noise, a soft tap, 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 coming from the back door. I tiptoed to Caleb's room and shook him awake. Caleb, there's someone outside. He groaned, rubbing his eyes. What are you talking about? I explained what I'd seen, and he reluctantly got up, following me to the kitchen. The tapping had stopped, but the feeling of dread lingered. Caleb peeked out the window. I don't see anyone. He whispered. Maybe you were just dreaming. I wasn't dreaming, man. He was there. We decided to check the house. Caleb grabbed a kitchen knife, and I picked up a heavy flashlight. We moved through the rooms quietly, making sure all the doors and windows were locked. When we reached the back door, we saw it, scratches on the wood, fresh and deep. Okay, that's creepy, Caleb admitted. We didn't sleep much after that. We stayed in the living room, keeping an eye on the windows. By morning, we were exhausted but relieved that nothing else had happened. We decided to tell Mrs. Talbot about it over breakfast. She frowned, concern etched on her face. I'm so sorry you boys had such a fright. That doesn't sound like anyone from around here. Maybe a drifter or someone passing through. I'll let the sheriff know. We thanked her and tried to enjoy the rest of our stay, but the incident lingered in the back of our minds. We spent the day exploring the nearby woods, hoping to shake off the unease. It worked for a while. The forest was beautiful, and we even found a secluded spot by a creek where we could relax and joke around like we used to in college. As evening approached, 
We made our way back to the bed and breakfast. Mrs. Talbot greeted us with a worried look. The sheriff came by while you were out. He said he'd keep an eye on the area tonight. You boys should be safe. Her reassurance helped a little, but we couldn't shake the feeling that something was still off. We decided to stay in that night, watch some movies, and keep the doors locked. By 11 p.m., we were starting to feel a bit more at ease. Caleb fell asleep on the couch, snoring softly, while I stayed up, flipping through channels. Just as I was about to doze off, I heard it again. Tap, tap, tap. This time, it was at the front door. My heart raced as I gently shook Caleb awake. He sat up, groggy but alert. What is it now? The tapping. It's back. We grabbed our makeshift weapons and approached the door cautiously. Caleb peeked through the peephole, then stepped back, his face pale. It's him, he whispered. I felt a surge of anger and fear. We need to confront him. Maybe scare him off for good. Caleb nodded reluctantly, and we flung the door open, stepping out onto the porch. The man stood there, just a few feet away, his blue eyes glinting in the moonlight. Up close, he looked even more unsettling, taller, more muscular, with a wild, almost feral look about him. What do you want? I demanded, trying to keep my voice steady. He didn't answer. Instead, he took a step forward, and I saw his mouth twist into a sneer. Before we could react, he lunged at Caleb, knocking him to the ground. I swung the flashlight, hitting the man's shoulder, but he barely flinched. Caleb struggled beneath him, the knife slashing through the air. I joined the fight, adrenaline pumping, but the man was incredibly strong. He knocked the knife out of Caleb's hand and threw me against the wall. I scrambled to my feet, desperate to help my friend. The man was on top of Caleb, his hands around his throat. I grabbed a nearby lamp and smashed it over the man's head. He roared in pain, finally releasing Caleb, who gasped for air. We didn't waste any time. We bolted back into the house, slamming the door shut and locking it. I could hear the man outside, pounding on the door, his growls echoing in the night. Call the sheriff! Caleb wheezed. I fumbled for my phone and dialed 911, my hands shaking. The operator assured me that help was on the way, but every second felt like an eternity. The pounding continued, growing louder and more frantic. Just when I thought the door would give way, we heard sirens in the distance. The pounding stopped, and the man's footsteps retreated. We stayed huddled in the living room until the sheriff arrived, bursting through the door with his deputies. They searched the area but found no trace of the man. Mrs. Talbot was beside herself with worry insisting we stay another night with extra patrols around the house. We agreed, but sleep was impossible. Every noise, every shadow kept us on edge. The next morning, the sheriff informed us that they'd found fresh tracks leading into the woods, but lost them near the creek. He advised us to cut our trip short and head back to Milwaukee. We didn't argue. On the drive back, Caleb and I barely spoke. The experience had shaken us both, and we just wanted to get home. Once we were back in the city, life slowly returned to normal, but the memory of that night never left us. A few months later, I got a call from Mrs. Talbot. She sounded relieved to hear my voice. Quincy, I wanted to let you know the sheriff caught the man who attacked you. He was hiding out in an abandoned cabin in the woods. They found, well, they found evidence linking him to other attacks. He's in custody now. I thanked her, feeling a strange mix of relief and lingering fear. I knew I should feel safer knowing he was caught, 
but part of me couldn't shake the feeling that there was more to it. Something about the way he moved, the strength he had. It wasn't normal. Life went on, but I couldn't forget what happened. Caleb and I drifted apart, the experience creating a rift either of us could mend. I threw myself into my work, trying to forget, but the memories lingered, haunting me in quiet moments. One night, as I was closing up my apartment, I caught a glimpse of something in the window, a flash of blue eyes, a hint of a sneer. I blinked, and it was gone. Just my imagination, I told myself. But deep down, I knew I'd never truly escape that night in Banjul. Some things, once experienced, stay with you forever. My name is Victor Langston, and this happened to me on September 14, 1994. I was a truck driver back then, running long hauls between Phoenix and Portland. I loved the solitude of the open road, the hum of the engine, and the feel of the asphalt under my wheels. But this particular trip is one I'll never forget. Not because of the journey— but because of what happened at the rest stop near Twin Falls, Idaho. I'd been on the road for about twelve hours, and my eyes felt like sandpaper. The coffee wasn't doing much anymore, so I decided to pull over for a quick nap. There's a rest area about fifteen miles outside Twin Falls, not much more than a couple of vending machines and a restroom, but it's quiet and usually empty at night perfect for a few hours of shut-eye. I parked my rig and climbed into the sleeper cab. I didn't even bother to set an alarm. I figured my body would wake me when it had enough, as it always did. I drifted off almost immediately, the sounds of the highway fading into the background. I woke up to a strange sound. It was subtle at first, almost like a whisper, but it grew louder, more insistent. It took a moment to realize it was someone trying the door handle on my cab. My first thought was that it was another driver needing help, but the insistence of the rattling set off alarm bells. No one in their right mind would try to open a stranger's truck in the middle of the night. I reached under my pillow for the baseball bat I always kept there. I didn't own a gun, never saw the need for one but a solid piece of wood could do plenty of damage if necessary. I stayed still, listening. The rattling stopped, and I heard footsteps moving away from the cab. I peeked through the curtains and saw a shadowy figure heading toward the restroom. I couldn't make out any details, but something about the way they moved made my skin crawl. I debated whether to confront the person or just drive off. Curiosity got the better of me. I slipped out of the truck, bat in hand, and crept toward the restrooms. The night was eerily silent, save for the distant hum of traffic. I reached the building and pressed my back against the wall, straining to hear any sound from inside. A soft thud, like something heavy hitting the floor, reached my ears. Then silence. I took a deep breath tightened my grip on the bat, and stepped inside. The restroom was dimly lit, the flickering fluorescent light casting unsettling shadows. There were three stalls, all closed. I bent down to look for feet under the doors but saw nothing. I pushed open the first stall door. Empty. The second stall was the same. As I reached for the third door— I heard a faint rustling behind me. I spun around, bat raised, but there was no one there. Just the dimly lit room and the hum of the flickering light. I turned back to the third stall and pushed it open. It was empty, too. I felt a mix of relief and confusion. Maybe I'd imagined the whole thing. The long hours on the road can mess with your mind. As I turned to leave... Something caught my eye in the mirror above the sinks. 
a dark shape, standing just outside the restroom door. My heart skipped a beat. I whipped around, but the doorway was empty. I was starting to think I was losing it. I backed out of the restroom, my eyes darting around the empty parking lot. There was no sign of the person who had tried my door. I hurried back to my truck, jumped in, and locked the doors. My pulse was racing, but I told myself it was just some drifter, maybe looking for a place to sleep or something to steal. Still, I didn't feel safe. I decided to drive to the next town, where I knew there'd be a truck stop with other drivers around. Safety in numbers and all that. I pulled out of the rest area, my eyes scanning the dark highway for any sign of movement. I was about five miles down the road when I saw headlights in my mirrors. A car was following me, its beams too bright in the dark. I sped up, but the car matched my speed. My palms were slick on the steering wheel. I didn't want to believe it, but it felt like the driver was after me. I decided to test it. I slowed down to let the car pass, but it stayed behind me. Then I sped up again, and it did the same. My heart was pounding. This was no coincidence. The truck stop was still a few miles away, and I wasn't sure if I'd make it before the car tried something. Then I saw it turn off for a small road leading into the hills. I didn't know where it went, but I figured a big rig like mine could handle it better than a car. I took the turn without signaling, my tires squealing on the asphalt. The car followed, but I could see its headlights bouncing in the rearview mirror as it struggled on the rougher road. I pushed my truck harder, navigating the twists and turns as best I could. After about ten minutes, the headlights disappeared. I didn't slow down, though. I kept going until I saw a clearing where I could pull over and turn off my lights. I sat there in the dark, listening, waiting for the sound of an engine. But there was nothing. Just the night and the distant sound of crickets. I waited for what felt like an eternity before I dared to start the engine again. I needed to get back to the highway, find that truck stop, and be around other people. I carefully made my way back to the main road, constantly checking my mirrors for any sign of those headlights. When I finally pulled into the truck stop, it felt like a weight lifted off my shoulders. I parked among the other rigs and headed inside to get a cup of coffee and calm my nerves. The place was brightly lit, the hum of conversation and clatter of dishes a comforting contrast to the silence of the night outside. I didn't sleep much that night. I kept thinking about the person at the rest stop and the car that followed me. Who were they? What did they want? I never got any answers, but I knew I wasn't imagining things. The next day, I called my buddy Jack, another trucker who ran the same routes. We'd been friends for years, and I knew I could trust him. I told him what happened, expecting him to laugh it off or say I was overreacting. But he didn't. Vic, he said, his voice serious. I've heard stories about that stretch of road. Drivers disappearing, strange people at rest stops. No one knows for sure what's going on, but you're not the first to have something like this happen. That sent a chill down my spine. Jack wasn't one to buy into ghost stories or urban legends. If he was taking it seriously, then I knew I wasn't crazy. I finished my delivery in Portland without any more incidents, but I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. Every rest stop, every lonely stretch of road, I found myself looking over my shoulder, waiting for something to happen. A few weeks later, I was back in Twin Falls on another run. I decided to stop at the same rest area, partly out of curiosity, partly to see if I could get some closure. It was daytime this time, and there were a few other trucks parked there. I felt a bit safer. 
I walked to the restroom, my bat left behind in the cab but my nerves on edge. The place looked the same, but it felt different in the daylight. Less sinister, more mundane. I pushed open the third stall door again, half expecting to find something, but it was empty. As I was about to leave, an older trucker walked in. He nodded at me and went about his business. I hesitated, then decided to ask him if he'd seen anything strange around here. He chuckled, shaking his head. Son, I've been driving these roads for thirty years. Seen all kinds of weird stuff. But if you're talking about the guy in the black sedan, you're not alone. A few drivers have mentioned being followed by someone like that. Cops don't do much about it, though. Just say it's someone messing around. That didn't make me feel any better. But at least I knew I wasn't the only one. I got back in my truck and headed out, my eyes still scanning the road, but with a bit more resolve. I wasn't going to let some creep scare me off my route. But I made a point to avoid stopping at deserted rest areas, sticking to the busy truck stops where I knew I'd be safer. Years later, I retired from trucking. The open road lost its appeal after that night. I never found out who was behind the wheel of that car, or what they wanted. Maybe it was just some punk playing a prank, or maybe it was something more sinister. But I'm grateful I trusted my instincts that night. It might have saved my life. Sometimes, when I tell this story to friends over a beer... They ask if I do anything different. I tell them no. I did what I had to do to stay safe. And if they're ever out on those lonely highways at night, they should do the same. Because you never know who might be watching. My name is Keegan York. And this all went down on November 17, 1993. I was 32 at the time, working as a search and rescue officer in Shasta Trinity National Forest in California. It's not the most popular park, but it's beautiful and rugged, a place where you could go days without seeing another soul if you ventured far enough off the trails. I had been at this job for nearly a decade, so I knew the terrain and the types of emergencies we usually faced. But nothing could have prepared me for what happened that day. I remember it was an unseasonably warm day for November, around 60 degrees. We got a call early in the morning about a missing hiker, a guy named Josh Morrow. He'd been reported missing by his wife after he didn't come back from a solo camping trip. The guy was an experienced hiker, which made it odd that he hadn't returned or at least sent some kind of message. We started our search at the trailhead where his car was found. Josh had signed the logbook before heading out, which gave us a starting point. The plan was to split up into teams and comb through the area he was supposed to be in. I was partnered with Pete Larson, another seasoned officer. Pete and I had been through a lot together— rescues, recoveries, and once even a bear scare. We knew how to handle ourselves in the wilderness. We hiked for hours, calling out Josh's name, but got no response. Around noon, we decided to take a break. Pete pulled out a sandwich, and I had a granola bar. We were sitting on a fallen log, talking about the game last night, Raiders lost again, when we heard it. It was a scream, sharp and distant, echoing through the trees. Did you hear that? Pete asked, his sandwich halfway to his mouth. Yeah, sounded like it came from the east, I replied, already getting up and grabbing my pack. We moved quickly, adrenaline kicking in, following the direction of the scream. It took us about fifteen minutes of hard hiking before we stumbled upon a clearing. And that's when we saw it. Josh Morrow was lying face down in the dirt, his body twisted unnaturally. 
blood pooled around him, soaking into the ground. I could see deep gashes across his back, and one of his arms looked like it had been almost torn off. Pete and I froze for a moment, the sight too horrific to process immediately. Jesus Christ, Pete muttered, breaking the silence. We approached cautiously, our training kicking in. We needed to secure the scene and call it in. I checked for a pulse, though I knew it was futile. Josh was dead. We need to call this in, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. Pete nodded and grabbed the radio from his pack, reporting our location and the situation. We were told to stay put and wait for backup. As we waited, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. The injuries Josh had sustained didn't look like they were caused by an animal. The gashes were too clean, too precise. And there were no tracks, no signs of a struggle. It was as if he had been attacked by something that didn't leave a trace. Hey, Keegan, Pete called out, snapping me back to reality. You seeing this? He was pointing to a nearby tree. I walked over and saw what he was talking about. There were markings on the trunk, deep scratches that looked almost like symbols. I couldn't make sense of them, but they gave me a bad feeling. We heard the backup team before we saw them, the crunch of their boots on the forest floor. They arrived, and we briefed them on what we had found. They took over the scene, and Pete and I were told to head back to base. Our shift was over, and they needed fresh eyes on this. As we made our way back, Pete and I couldn't stop talking about what we'd seen. The whole thing felt wrong. You think it could have been a bear? Pete asked, though he sounded unsure. No bear I've ever seen does that, I replied. And those marks on the tree. I don't know, Pete. This doesn't feel right. We got back to base, filed our reports, and tried to shake off the day. But that night, I couldn't sleep. Every time I closed my eyes, I saw Josh's twisted body and those strange symbols. I had to know more. I needed answers. The next day, I went to see Dr. Alice Lang, our local coroner, and an old friend of mine. She was in the middle of examining Josh's body when I arrived. Hey, Alice, I said, trying to sound casual. You got any preliminary findings? Alice looked up from her work, her face serious. Keegan, this is unlike anything I've seen before. The wounds are precise, almost surgical. This wasn't an animal attack. And these symbols you mentioned, they're strange. I've sent photos to a colleague of mine who specializes in ancient languages and symbols. Maybe he can make sense of them. Thanks, Alice. Keep me posted, will you? I asked, feeling a mix of relief and dread. Relief that I wasn't crazy, and dread because it meant something far more sinister was at play. Days turned into weeks, and the forest felt different. There were whispers among the team about Josh's death, about the symbols. But we had a job to do, and life went on. Then, another hiker went missing. Her name was Laura Holt, and she was last seen on a trail not far from where we found Josh. The search was on again. This time, we were more prepared. We knew something was out there, something dangerous. We moved in teams kept constant communication, and stayed alert. But despite our efforts, we found nothing. No signs, no clues, nothing. One night, I was at home, nursing a beer and trying to unwind, when my phone rang. It was Alice. Keegan, you need to come over. Now. I drove over to her place, my mind racing. When I arrived, she ushered me into her study. I got a reply from my colleague, she said, handing me a printout of an email. He says the symbols are old, really old. They're related to some kind of ancient ritual. 
He couldn't be sure, but it's linked to summoning or calling something. I read the email, the words blurring as my mind tried to process them. So what are we dealing with, some kind of cult? I asked, though it felt absurd even as I said it. I don't know, Alice replied. But whatever it is, it's dangerous. And it's still out there. The next day, we briefed the team on what Alice had found. We decided to keep it quiet, not wanting to cause a panic. But we were more vigilant than ever. And then it happened again. Another scream, another body, another set of symbols. This time, it was Pete. We found him in the same condition as Josh, torn apart and surrounded by those damned symbols. I felt a rage and a helplessness I had never known. This was my friend, my partner, and I had no idea how to stop whatever was doing this. I took some time off after Pete's death. I needed to clear my head, figure out what to do next. I spent hours poring over books and articles, anything that might give me a clue. And then I found it. An old journal from a 19th century explorer who had traveled through the area. He wrote about a creature, something that stalked the woods and left strange symbols. He called it The Watcher. It sounded like a campfire story but it was all I had. I went back to Alice, showed her the journal. What do you think? I asked. I think it's a long shot, but it's something. She replied. If this watcher is real, we need to find a way to stop it. Armed with this new information, we put together a plan. We would go back to the area where Josh and Pete had been found, tried to lure the watcher out, and confront it. It was risky, but we were out of options. The night of the operation, the forest was eerily quiet. We moved in a tight formation, our eyes scanning the darkness. And then we saw it. A shadow, moving between the trees, too fast and too silent to be human. We followed it, our hearts pounding. It led us to a clearing, and there it was. The Watcher. It was tall, with long, sinewy limbs and eyes that seemed to glow in the dark. It didn't move, just watched U.S. Now! I shouted, and we opened fire. The bullets seemed to have no effect, passing through the creature as if it were smoke. It let out a sound, not a growl, but a deep, resonant noise that seemed to shake the ground. And then it attacked. It moved with blinding speed, slashing at us with its claws. We fought back, but it was like trying to fight a shadow. One by one, my team went down, their screams echoing through the night. I was the last one standing, bleeding and exhausted. The watcher loomed over me, its eyes cold and unfeeling. I thought it was the end, but then it stopped. It looked at me for a long moment, then turned and disappeared into the forest. I don't know why it spared me, but I was alive. Barely. I made my way back to base, my body aching and my mind numb. They found me the next morning, barely conscious and rambling about the Watcher. In the aftermath, the area was closed off, officially due to dangerous wildlife. I was put on leave, and the deaths were quietly swept under the rug. But I couldn't forget. I still have nightmares, still see those glowing eyes in the dark. I never went back to the forest after that. I moved away, tried to start fresh. But the watcher is always there, lurking in the back of my mind. And every now and then, I hear about another missing hiker, another unexplained death. I don't know what the Watcher is or what it wants, but I know it's still out there. And I know that one day, it will come for me. But until then, I try to live my life, haunted by the shadows of the past and the knowledge that some things are beyond our understanding.
My name is Orson Gallagher, and this happened to me on the 163rd day of 2007. I'm a software engineer by trade, but I've always been a bit of an outdoorsman. After a long week at work, I like to pack up my gear and head out into the wilderness, where the only sounds are the birds, the wind in the trees, and my own thoughts. It's my way of recharging, of finding a bit of peace in an otherwise hectic life. So, there I was, planning a weekend getaway to a small, lesser-known spot in the Ozarks. I'd heard about it from a buddy of mine, Lyle Purvis, who said it was a great place to get away from it all. Lyle's a bit of a jokester, always trying to get a laugh, so when he told me the place was called Devil's Hollow, I laughed it off. Sounded like a load of nonsense, but Lyle swore it was the best camping spot he'd ever been to. I packed up my old Ford truck with my gear, tent, sleeping bag, a cooler full of beer, and enough supplies to last a couple of days. The drive out was uneventful, just a lot of winding roads and the occasional deer darting across my path. I got to the trailhead around noon, parked the truck, and started the hike into the hollow. The trail was narrow and a bit overgrown, but nothing I couldn't handle. The trees were thick, their branches creating a canopy that blocked out most of the sunlight. It was cooler down there, the air damp and smelling of earth and leaves. I made good time, reaching a small clearing by mid-afternoon. It was perfect flat ground for my tent, a fire pit someone had built, and a stream nearby for fresh water. I set up camp, got a fire going, and settled in for the night. As the sun set, the forest came alive with the sounds of crickets and frogs. I cracked open a beer and sat by the fire, feeling the stress of the week melt away. Around midnight I decided to turn in, I was just drifting off when I heard it, a rustling sound, like someone or something moving through the underbrush. I sat up, my heart pounding. Lyle, if that's you messing with me, I swear I'll kick your ass, I called out. There was no answer, just more rustling. I grabbed my flashlight and unzipped the tent, shining the beam around the clearing. Nothing. I listened for a minute but all I heard was the usual night sounds. I shrugged it off and went back to bed. The next morning, I woke up early, ready to explore. I spent the day hiking around, fishing in the stream, and just enjoying the solitude. By the time evening rolled around, I was exhausted. I made a simple dinner over the fire and decided to turn in early. That's when things got weird. I was lying in my tent, staring up at the nylon ceiling, when I heard it again, the rustling. But this time, it was closer, like it was right outside my tent. I sat up and grabbed my flashlight, my hand shaking a bit as I unzipped the tent. The beam of light cut through the darkness, and for a second, I thought I saw something, a figure, small and hunched over with eyes that seemed to glow in the reflection of the light. Hey! Who's there? I shouted. The figure darted away, disappearing into the trees. I jumped out of the tent and followed, the flashlight beam bouncing wildly as I ran. I chased it for what felt like miles, but it always stayed just out of reach. Finally, I stopped, panting and sweating, my heart hammering in my chest. I was lost deep in the woods, with no idea how to get back to my camp. I stood there, catching my breath, trying to figure out which way to go. That's when I heard it, a child's voice, whispering my name. Orson! Orson! My blood ran cold. Who's there? I called out. Show yourself! There was no answer, just the whispering, growing fainter and fainter until it disappeared altogether. I shone the flashlight around, but all I saw were trees and shadows. I was alone. 
I took a deep breath and tried to calm down. All right, Orson, get a grip. You're just tired. You're hearing things. I turned around and started walking, hoping I was heading back towards my camp. After what felt like hours, I finally stumbled into the clearing. The fire had died down to embers, and my tent stood there, looking somehow smaller and more fragile. I crawled inside and zipped it up tight, my mind racing. What the hell had I seen? And what was with that whispering? The next morning, I decided I'd had enough. I packed up my gear and started the hike back to my truck. I was on edge, jumping at every little sound, but the hike out was uneventful. I reached my truck, tossed my gear in the back, and got the hell out of there. I didn't tell anyone about what happened, not even Lyle. I figured they'd just laugh it off or think I was crazy. But I couldn't shake the feeling that I wasn't alone out there, that something had been watching me. A few weeks later, I ran into Lyle at a bar. We were having a couple of beers, shooting the breeze, when he asked me how my trip to Devil's Hollow had been. I hesitated for a moment, then decided to tell him. It was weird, I said. I think I saw something out there. Or someone. Lyle's face went pale. You saw them too, didn't you? He whispered. I frowned. Saw who? He leaned in close, lowering his voice. The children with the black eyes. I stared at him, my heart pounding. What are you talking about, Lyle? He took a deep breath. There's a story that goes around about those woods. They say there are these kids with eyes as black as coal. They're not right, Orson. They're something else. People say they can make you see things, hear things. And if you follow them, well, some folks never come back. I felt a chill run down my spine. Why the hell didn't you tell me this before? Lyle shrugged, looking genuinely scared. I thought it was just a stupid story. I didn't think you'd actually see them. I didn't know what to say. Part of me wanted to laugh it off, but another part of me, a bigger part, was terrified. I'd seen something out there, and now I knew I wasn't the only one. I tried to put it out of my mind, but it kept creeping back in. I couldn't sleep, couldn't focus at work. I started having nightmares, seeing those black eyes staring at me from the darkness. I knew I had to do something, had to find out what the hell was going on. So, I did what any rational person would do. I went back. I packed up my gear, loaded up the truck, and headed back to Devil's Hollow. This time, I brought a gun. I wasn't about to be caught off guard again. The hike-in was just as I remembered, but this time, I felt a sense of dread hanging over me. I reached the clearing, set up camp, and waited. As night fell, I sat by the fire, my gun in my lap, listening for any sound, any sign of those kids. It didn't take long. Just as I was about to turn in, I heard it, the rustling. I grabbed my flashlight and stood up my heart pounding. Come on out! I shouted. I know you're there! For a moment, there was silence. Then, a small figure stepped out of the trees. It was a child, no more than ten years old, with pale skin and eyes as black as night. It stared at me, unblinking. What do you want? I asked, my voice shaking. The child didn't answer. It just stood there, staring at me with those black eyes. I raised my gun, my hand trembling. Stay back! I warned. The child took a step forward. I squeezed the trigger. The shot echoed through the clearing, but the child didn't flinch. It just kept coming. I fired again and again, but the bullets seemed to pass right through it. 
I backed up, stumbling over my own feet, my mind racing. What the hell was this thing? Then I heard the whispering again, that same eerie voice calling my name. Orson! Orson! I turned and ran, not caring where I was going, just needing to get away. The whispering followed me, growing louder and more insistent. I tripped over a root and fell, the gun flying out of my hand. I scrambled to my feet, looking around wildly. The child was gone, but the whispering was still there, echoing through the trees. I ran until I couldn't run any more, collapsing to the ground, gasping for breath. The whispering had stopped, and I was alone in the darkness. I lay there for what felt like hours, too scared to move. When the sun finally rose, I picked myself up and started walking. I didn't know where I was, but I had to keep moving. Eventually, I stumbled onto a trail and followed it until I reached the road. I flagged down a passing car and got a ride back to town. I never went back to Devil's Hollow after that. I couldn't. I don't know what those things were, but I knew I couldn't face them again. I tried to go back to my normal life, but it was hard. The nightmares kept coming, and I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. A few months later, I heard that a hiker had gone missing in those woods. They never found him. I couldn't help but wonder if he'd seen the same thing I had, if those kids with the black eyes had taken him. I don't go camping anymore. I stay in my apartment, surrounded by four walls and a locked door. It's not the same, but it's safe. And that's all that matters now. Lyle stopped joking about Devil's Hollow, too. We don't talk about it at all, really. It's like an unspoken agreement between us. We both know what's out there, and we both know we're lucky to have made it out. So, if you ever hear about a place called Devil's Hollow, do yourself a favor, stay far, far away. Some stories are better left untold, and some places are better left unexplored. Trust me on that.